produce RCS series products. At the hardware level, we provide more digital IOs, including 24 digital inputs, 24 digital outputs, analog inputs and outputs, 100M and gigabyte ethernet. We also provide a more powerful drive capability in terms of hardware. Moreover, we also support Profinet, Ethernet IP, Modbus RTU, TCP, and other mainstream field bus communications protocols. We have a higher system bus frequency of 500 Hz and provide more low-level control interfaces. We define the CS series as a platform-level product of Cobots in an effort to maximize the capabilities of robot manufacturers to provide a safe and flexible collaborative robot products that are the simplest to use. On this basis, we help our clients and integrators to lower the threshold for deploying Cobots. Two years ago, Elite started to plan a new generation of Cobots. The launch of the CS series helped to bring our latest understanding of Cobots into reality. This is the type of product that exemplifies the state-of-the-art level of the industry. Elite CS series Cobots are equipped with multiple patented technologies to enhance safety which is complied with international standards such as the EN ISO 10218, EN ISO 13849 and ISO slash TS15066. The wrist joint's module design of all robots is optimized to further increase the safety of human-machine collaboration. The CS series joint modules are designed in a more advanced way, which can be replaced in just 10 minutes. A brand new single board control system is implanted for better reliability and stability. Update of software and control box, each pendant, joint module, and flange I.O. are fully supported. 
In addition to hardware improvements, the software of the CS Siri Cobots has also been comprehensively upgraded. Elite adopts a new type of lightweight and widescreen teach pendant that supports touchscreen control for more intuitive operation. The programming language is a new robot scripting language that supports standard Python with an excellent scalability and high degree of freedom. The two letters of the CS series embody Elite's future layout of collaborative robot technology. C is for the initial letter of Cobot, which means collaborative robot. And the S stands for safe, simple, superior, sustainable, and scalable. Next, let's take scalability for example to introduce our CS series products. At the hardware level, we provide more digital IOs, including 24 digital inputs, 24 digital outputs, analog inputs and outputs, 100M and gigabyte ethernet. We also provide a more powerful drive capability in terms of hardware. Moreover, we also support Profinet, Ethernet IP, Modbus RTU, TCP, and other mainstream field bus communications protocols. We have a higher system bus frequency of 500 Hertz and provide more low-level control interfaces. We define the CS series as a platform-level product of Cobots in an effort to maximize the capabilities of robot manufacturers to provide a safe and flexible collaborative robot products that are the simplest to use. On this basis, we help our clients and integrators to lower the threshold for deploying Cobots. Hello? Do you hear my voice? Check, check. Hello, hello. Okay, great. Ladies and gentlemen, hello, good day. I'm your host, Jack, editor for Ringo Trade Media, and I'd like to welcome all of you to our exciting virtual conference today, Asian Smart Logistics Warehouse and E-Commerce Summit 2021. Now, this summit will be assisting supply chains in Asia to improve logistics movement and warehouse storage for an even more efficient future. This is our very first warehouse logistic and e-commerce event ever held by Ringer. Smart logistics is the multi-dimensional integration of people, vehicle, and goods. 
which refers to the use of intelligent warehouse internet uh, of things, IOTs, big data, and other intelligent technologies. And methods to improve the ability of logistics system analysis and design making, uh, sorry, decision making and intelligent execution and enhance the intelligence and automation of the entire logistics system. So it's very exciting today. Before we start, I would like to welcome uh, all of you to learn our uh, business partners for today's event. We have Elite Robot. Found in 2016, Elite Robot is a spin-off robot, uh, robotics developer initiated by a group of PhD, machronics, and software engineers from Beihan University. It is engaged in the R&D and manufacture of collaborative co robots, co-robots, cobots, including reducers, underlying operating systems, embedded hardware and software, and modular joints. Now, let's play a short video of Elite Robot for you to know more about this company. Thank you for Eli Robot. Now, I would like to welcome all of you to learn our another business partner, Intero Group, a leading provider of material handling solutions. Intero provides system inte uh, integrators and OEMs with a wide range of platform based products and services in these categories. Rollers, uh, that's conveyor rollers and drivers. Motors and drives for convey system, conf conveyor systems, and conveyors and short chargers as well as pallet handling, pallet conveyors and flow storage system. Here's a short video for Intero Group to learn more about this company and their products too. So let's look at this video. What drives us? Is it to define standards and pushing boundaries in our industry? Is it to reinvent material handling permanently? Or providing leading platforms for any purpose? Is it the fact that we are taking responsibility for every aspect of our work? Or to be the best active networker out there. There is only one reason. You and your business. Because for us, 
Customer centricity is not only a promise, it is our obsession. Customer comfort and confidence. That's Interroll. Hi, that's a great video for both our business partners. I love their videos. So before we start our sessions and listen to their great, exciting presentations, let me explain some important reminders about the event page right now. Uh, since you all are attending in this event already, I'd like to introduce you some of the functions of this event website. As you can see me in the live presentation area under the conference room, you can have the chat room chat box on the right hand side. It's very important to leave a message, introduce yourself and also ask questions. Seize your chance to learn more from our experts today. And also in the lobby, there's another chat room. Look at here on the right side. There's a chat room here as well. So don't forget you can uh, have network networking with people there. Introduce yourself as well here. And also you can learn more from our speakers. Our speakers and the, there's a big star chat button here. One click the star chat, you can have a private message to this to uh, talk to these speakers. And also lastly, don't forget, pay a visit to their exhibit hall. You have to be there because you can uh, contact them for our uh, exhibitors through emails, website, and Facebook linkings to uh, contact them to learn more about our exhibitors today. And they're gonna have a great, exciting, insightful presentation as well. So as I just said, click this star chat and the private message box will pop up. You can just simply say hi to our speakers today from Elite, see? There's a private message box just pop up. You can have more deeper, further discussion on each topic you want related to the logistic topic. And also you can leave an open question here under the XB whole chat box as well. Simply as I can see, I just say hi to our uh, exhibitor from uh, Elite. Also, please pay attention to Interos uh, booth great information and uh, log, uh, content information and videos there too. And lastly, we have Vietnam Logistic Business Association as well. So go back to conference room, get ready for our next exciting presentation. Okay, let me go back to the presentation agenda. Today, we have very interesting topics from our expert guest speakers. So let me give you a quick rundown of this uh, event. First one, we will begin with our event with uh, opening remark right now. And then later is one open speech from DHL. Then followed by the, uh, the second one, the technical presentation from Eli Robot and then Intero. Next. It's a keynote speech from Lazada. We will also have a virtual factory tour from Elite Robot afterwards. After Lazada, there's Elite uh, factory tour. Very exciting. And then followed by another keynote speech and this time from Hala Logistics. Finally, we will have a panel discussion titled Smart Logistics, the powerful force reshaping business today. It's very exciting and all our speakers are gonna attend there and have a great discussion on these topics. So, very exciting, right? Let's start with our live presentation. Just a quick reminder, uh, all of you, we will have a great opportunity to submit the text questions to our presenters by typing your questions into the chat box I just show you right on the right hand side. You may send your presentation, I mean your questions under uh, during their presentation at any time. 
during their presentation or before that, after that, to our speakers. They will address them after their presentation, which is a live Q&A part. Very interesting. All right, let me introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Mr. Zhongguo. Zhongguo, I'm now making you as a attendee. Please try to turn on your microphone and camera. And let us welcome Mr. Zhongguo, Innovation Manager from DHL. He will talk about shaping the future of logistics. Hello, Zhongguo. Hi, hi, everyone. Hope you can hear me and see me fine. That's great. And this is your presentation. Now, would you please, uh, if you can, it's better for you to share your presentation slide from your side, right? Yeah, sure. Just give me a minute. Let me share my screen with you. Of course. Can That's you... great. Yes, I see it now. Great. So now you may have the floor. So dear attendees, don't forget, seize your chance to ask your questions to Mr. Zongo from DHL. See you guys later. Thanks, Jack. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Song Kuo, Innovation Manager at the DHL Asia Pacific Innovation Center. Um, today, very glad to be here in a virtual conference to share with you our innovation journey uh, that we are um, embarking on in DHL and really helping us push boundaries and really shape the future of logistics. So hopefully it gives you some form of insights on what we do and also show you a little different side of DHL. So I'm sure everyone here has heard uh, some form of DHL before. Um, I hope so. Um, most of the time, the picture you have is really a delivery guy in a typical yellow shirt coming to you, bringing your online shopping. Um, but that's just actually one part of our express, our business, which is our express business. And DHL is actually much more than that. In fact, uh, we are the world's largest logistics company with almost you know, half a million people employed globally, uh, providing end-to-end -end supply chain solutions for our customers from global forwarding, warehousing, to even poster and e-commerce services. Um, quick background for myself, I'm from uh, the business unit, which is horizontal across the organization. Um, it's called Customer Solutions and Innovation, and we manage you know, approximately VHL's 80 largest customers globally. You know, um, cross-selling solutions from all over the organizations. Um, innovation where I'm from focus a little bit more on advanced topics. We are a bit much more relaxed. Uh, require that require research and experimentation. Uh, we focus more on mid to long-term innovation in topics you know, such as artificial intelligence, you know, Internet of Things, robotics, you know, which we have seen uh, from some of these robotics partner here in the conference, and so on and so forth. Um, we experiment, you know, develop proof of concepts. You know, if an idea works, we suggest it to our business. And if it doesn't, you know, we work at it and revisit the topic again. So let me just quickly jump into the op topic today. Um, you know, the pandemic has affected the global economy as well as our individual lives. You know, in, on an individual level, um, you know, has affected how we work and how we live. You know, it has come together. Uh, many of us, similarly as me, are working from home, you know, spending more time online meetings and even virtual conferences like this. Um, many businesses also had to quickly adapt to the challenges posed by COVID, and especially in areas of their supply chains when many countries went into a lockdown. So we see some factors potentially impacting supply chain, and one of which is really you know, changing response measures from various countries, and especially at the beginning of the pandemic. You know, measures vary based on different stages of outbreak. Uh, and of course, it's, because, it's becoming a bit more unpredictable. Therefore, supply chain disruptions may thus be a bit more intermittent and difficult to predict. Um, secondly, really, you know, it's about the next logistics bottlenecks and capacity challenges. Um, air passenger volume are low with grounding of flights, you know, which means also, you know, air freight prices will be high, especially when there is demand for also urgent stock replenishments globally, right? And ocean carriers need time to also rebalance the capacity, you know, and manage the shortage of containers globally. Uh, the third also, you know, we talk about this whole supply chain bull whip effect. So demand fluctuations are expected, right, due to the changing pandemic response. Um, but at the same time, the supply uncertainty also excavated by inventory and transport bottlenecks. Last, of course, I don't know, kind of very directly impacting everyone you know, in, this, in, the, in the world is really the whole uh, the GDP growth, the whole economic outlook is also being affected, right? The big the big economies like China, US, and EU are also impacted by the pandemic. No, but on the other hand, you know, I also wish to surface like you know, right, the global economic activity is also shifting. 
um, you know, towards East Asia. You know, in fact, if you read that it's projected, right, that the world's economic center of gravity, uh, you know, by 2050 might be just located literally between India and China. And why is that so? You know, this is evident, especially, you know, right, Asia Pacific accounts for almost 35% of the world's GDP and still growing. You know, in fact, 60% of GDP growth is powered by the Asia Pacific region. And why is this so? Um, really, you know, much of it simply is that Asia Pacific accounts for already more than 54% of the world population and with a growing middle class in AP. And, and if you look here, and by 2030, you know, the focus of the global consumer marketplace will probably have shifted uh, to, into Asia with them driven partly by the increase in middle class. Um, Few years back, you know, the Innovation Center in Asia research jumped into research, you know, to research a bit more about the trends in Asia Pacific. And what we found out is that Asian consumers, you know, be, has begun to embrace digital uh, really fast. Uh, so if asked around the room right now, you know, most people probably own some form of smart device today. Uh, very, pretty much very digital and tech savvy. You can almost buy anything online. Uh, case in point, uh, you know, my three-year-old nephew, you know, has his own Netflix profile at such a young age. You know, can navigate his way around YouTube. You know, and in fact, even point out what he wants to buy on all your online portals. But on a more serious note, it really shows that Asia Pacific is also leading the world in advancing on the digital infrastructure. You know, in fact, we've seen that governments are investing in smart cities. You know, 64% of smart cities are currently now in Asia Pacific. Uh, to share with you, you know, locally in Singapore, we are also having our smart nation initiatives to drive digitalization you know, within our economy, within our, for our people as well. Um, and also to note, right, you know, like the Chinese acute sense of value for money uh, makes them highly willing to share. It's by far uh, the largest sharing economy, uh, economy in the world. You know, our digital natives here have more smartphones in Apex, you can see in the infographic, as compared to our US and EU counterparts. And this app will continue to grow wider, you know, as technology advances. You know, digital marketplace will continue to pop up. You know, has has already exploded all around. You know, with you know, mark with with apps like Grab and Gojek, uh, to support this form of new customers. And then what that really translates to, right? Um, you know, supply chains really need to evolve with time as well. You know, at a global scale, we see an explosion of startups transforming our world with digital solutions. You know, over the years, we have also seen what 30 billion of VC investment in just logistics focused startup alone, and over 3,000 of startups actively. In fact, the numbers will probably have doubled or tripled today. And very much with the huge number of services that DHL offers, we also found out that there is this one startup that can actually provide the same similar service. So we really need to evolve and up our game, uh, not see it as a competition, but really, you know, how can we adopt technology within supply chain and make it more efficient? And more productive. So, how do we evolve? Uh, in DHL, one instrument to navigate our evolutions really starts from the simple radar. Um, this is actually our fifth edition of our trend radar, logistics trend radar, uh, to help you understand a bit uh, more. Um, underlay, underlay, underlying this trend radar is really our innovation mode and also the concept of trend research. So, what we do is spend time talking to our customers to understand you know, what really keeps them up at night. Additionally, to researchers, consultancies, you know, identify some of these mega trends out there that, that might have direct impact of us or to our customers. So for seeing this for the first time, so here's how it really works. Very quickly, uh, this chart plots dimension into three. You can follow me firstly left to write for whether a trend is a social business trend or a technological trend. Of course, the cool, cool part of it on our radar. Uh, secondly, top to bottom on how impactful the trend is to logistics. Lastly, you can see the inner to outer cycle on whether a trend is relevant in the first five years or beyond. So when you look at this edition of trend radar, you will see technologies like artificial intelligence, robotics being very, very relevant in the first five years. And in fact, it will make life so much more convenient, right, for businesses or even personally, right? Um, you know, trends like Internet of Things, I believe today um, we have already using some form of smart devices at home, smart lighting, smart fridges, smart locks, right? Uh, to automatically remotely unlock your door, um, even buying stuff on Amazon Prime. Uh, life and the world will continue to keep getting more digital, more convenient, and more efficient with all this technology advice.
All right. <laughs> we seems like uh, Mr. Zhongguo has some connection problem. Let's wait for a little longer for him to reconnect. Hello, Zhongguo. We we cannot miss you uh, for a short time. Sorry, I, am I back? Yeah, you're back, fully back right now. Please go on. So sorry about that. Um, okay, I'll just continue. Uh, so I was just talking about our innovation value chain. Uh, so from the trend radar, we deep dive onto one or two trends a year with a trend report. You know, engage our partners and exhibit at the innovation centers and deliver proof of concepts. Um, if successful, we commercialize them for bigger topics like Internet of Things and Big Data, dedicate more resources to explore the different use cases. So using this very simple method, you know, our global innovation centers have delivered more than 200 to 300 projects over the last few years. And really want to share that our philosophy to innovation is really to think big, um, start small and, you know, fail fast, right? Really literally working like how a startup would do. So today, um, I hope to share with you a series of case studies in the topics that the centers are heavily focused on. <clears throat> uh, the first is really on robotics and automation um, and how we are meeting demand and increasing productivity through robots. Um, why robotics and automation? You know, supply chains typically is a very traditional industry. Uh, some of you might agree and see in that. Um, you know, 80% of the warehouse are still pretty much brand manual. Um, out of that, out of the 100%, 15% we call them mechanized. So mechanized, you know, is literally using uh, your conveyor belt system. And only 5% are fully automated. You know, still again, 48% paper-based area bills are being used. And average age of workers in logistics industries is about 55 years old for us. So let me show you two examples of how we are leveraging robotics to increase productivity. Uh, so I'm just gonna play a video next and you can see how we are implementing uh, different kind of robots in the two different use cases in our operations. There are specifically three roles that I would like this robot to play. First, transferring of non-conveyable shipment for an outbound uh, process and an inbound process. And the final and third role is to transfer empty totes from point A to point B within the warehouse. Uh, AGV solved uh, two or three major issues. Number one is to have uh, an error-free operation. If you program the AGV and the system, it picks up all of the data, which comes also from the customer, and it moves the shipment from one place to the other with almost 100% accuracy. Number two, Although we have a very good safety record in all of our operations, there is an inherent risk that a forklift might uh, create an accident. So the AGVs with the technology uh, take away that element of risk. That's it. And thirdly, they're so productive that we can uh, lower our costs. And when we lower our costs, we can reinvest back into new technology and back into the staff. Look, the vision of the future, as my daughter says to me every day, is that nobody has to do anything. We put a shipment in one end and it comes out the other end and it's all done by the machine or the, the robotics inside. I would like to move on to a robotics unloading capability. Uh, so as you can see, you know, uh, this very simple idea and, the, the, and what we have achieved is to really reduce error and right? fully automating certain process uh, within our operations and really at the same time increase safety of our employees, you know, by reducing the movement of the forklifts. The next example is the use of robotic arms. So let's just see what is happening within our operations. Working with Gorba has actually been a game changer for us. We've been able to bring in robotics automation, innovative solutions to a task that is manual and we do every day. It's just been amazing to be able to provide more accuracy, more efficiency in our operations.
you know, this really benefited the operations with, you know, a throughput of up to 1,000 to about 1,005 units per hour. Uh, in a one expect, right, that we are testing and of course looking at to scale it across our operations and making it more efficient for the other operations across the region. So ideas again, very simple, rather than standing and sorting with multiple manpower, um, the robot takes up the repetitive tasks and then time is free up for these employees to move more value added tasks uh, across our operations. So besides these two use cases, I also like to share and what we have identified around uh, in, our, in our operations is the other 18 use cases in the area of robotics, you know, where robotics could potentially be applicable, you know, in the different process of the supply chain. And as we saw in the video, you know, hopefully the vision is a full automation. And at every point, at every point, we have some form of, of a robot doing the work. But that again, that's a vision. Uh, next, we are moving uh, again. Also, a, a clear sign of DHL um, investing in robots. You know, in US, we have now scaled up to about 2K, 2,000 robots in one of our DHL warehouses. So again, our commitment to just digitalize our operations and invest into innovation. Uh, quickly, uh, in the essence of time, next really move on from the physical hardware to the data-driven devices. Uh, the next big topic for us is really, you know, the whole idea of big data analytics. Uh, we have built our own internal analytics capability within DHL, created in Singapore based on our customer feedback. In fact, uh, started our analytics lab a few years back uh, with, a, with a, hiring a bunch of data scientists, you know, experimenting with machine learning algorithms uh, and setting up our data infrastructure. Uh, let me quickly share with you, you know, how DHL is doing data analytics and how it's adding value, right? Um, you know, data analytics can create value on at least four different levels, descriptive analytics, uh, understanding what happened, and diagnostic analytics on why did it happen. So these two levels are better known as your business intelligence, if you would say, which I'm sure most of our companies is already been leveraging on to generate very useful insights. Um, what about what is more interesting is as we proceed along the value chain of data analytics, you know, predictive analytics, which is about predicting the future today. And if you can forecast the future, you know, why not optimize your response to it? And this is also when big data comes into play. Uh, imagine the even greater opportunities that leveraging external data such as holiday, weather patterns, and even Internet of Things input could bring. So here our ambition is to work on true big data prediction topics. Again, that's our vision. But however, we learned that equally important is to generate value through creating insights as well. So this example that I'm showing you is also with the concept of inventory planning. Um, here we work with a beverage distributor, which was facing operational challenges due to changing consumer behavior. I know even though beer consumption has been declining, uh, microbreweries are making their way to your table. So your craft beers, you know, people are changing the way they drink beers. Uh, in fact, microbreweries exploded by a factor of six times in less than 10 years. And if you are a distributor, you need to stop six times more SKUs than before. Uh, doesn't help that come in all shapes and sizes, very much a logistical nightmare, right? Uh, inventory saw to manage the increased SKUs. Uh, warehouse space runs out for normal operations, let alone during holiday seasons. You know, service level will suffer. You know, additionally, right, consumers like us are now more demanding. Taking three days to deliver was no longer fast enough. Uh, customers now want same day delivery. Again, adding more pressure on operations, which did not really evolve in time. And as you can imagine, the impact on customer levels as well as business bottom line, right? So what we did for our customer here, we built a diagnostic tool to analyze the inventory and demand comprehensively. Uh, took three years of inbound, outbound, and inventory data, over 1 billion data points, and analyzed at an SKU level. Uh, inside here that I would like to share was that some fast-moving stocks were placed at the regional distribution warehouse, which was located really far away. In contrast, there were slowly slow-moving stocks placed near customers at local distribution centers. So this resulted in a lot of unnecessary transshipment activities, which also meant uh, improved, uh, uh, increase in operations and increase in costs. So another key insight was a safety stock for some SKUs were higher than policy levels. Uh, this meant that there was excess inventory in the system, which also means higher warehousing costs and also working capital needs. So besides corporate operation compliance, a key reason uh, for the really high safety stock holding was also very poor demand forecast, right? And so what do we do here? You know, our forecasting approach that we recommended, you know, beat the planning team's forecast by almost 10%, which translates to 23% of storage space and more importantly, 37% uh, working capital. And that's really a you know, real project that we have done. And, and it's really data into insights and within 
a very short period of one month period of time when we did this for our customer. Um, we have built this into a tool and now uh, can apply this to various customers generating insights, uh, which will take months, months and months for them to do. Um, so next topic I would like to touch on is also uh, the whole topic on artificial intelligence. Um, very uh, interesting, exciting topic. In fact, that we are exploring you know, the holy grail of predictive analytics is really about AI. Uh, wouldn't it be great you know, you know, if AI can tell us where to stock our products optimally and trigger a whole entire fulfillment you know, automatically? Uh, but let me share with you some very exciting potential of AI in other areas uh, that we are looking at in, in the DHL and our supply chain operations. You know, our trend report on AI uh, describes AI in three ways, speaking, seeing, and thinking. Uh, so the use of AI and enable robotics, computer vision systems, you know, conversational interfaces and autonomous vehicles, um, you know, embodiment of AI in our logistical operations. So hopefully this tool will augment the capabilities of our employees today. And through AI, we believe our tools will be much smarter in our operations. So for example, our warehouse management systems and, other, and many other systems can be operated effectively by voice command. So really voice recognition. Um, number two, computer vision technologies will allow us to identify our customer shipment automatically like creating a dimension of the uh, shipment, scanning the label, and apply the right handling requirements automatically. The last use case uh, is an interesting one that we, we will be trying to work in Singapore, still very much in an exploratory and testing stage. Uh, it starts with augmented reality technology by allowing technical service teams you know, to communicate remotely via an app, which we see now, right? Uh, that some form of these technologies are already present. In this app, our teams can exchange images, communicate effectively. You know, as we gain more image data, we want to develop an AI tool, right, that can recognize images, learn to troubleshoot issues, and identify reference cases, right, to better aid in employees working on site and in making better decisions. Uh, today, I think we have seen very a lot of examples of how AI can already identify uh, cancerous tumors, recognize phases, you know, even recognizing defective parts at such a micro level. So there's are really tons of opportunities area that we are trying to explore as well and to complement the capabilities uh, of our workforce. Uh, the last topic um, which I really want to also touch on is uh, the whole topic about Internet of Things. Uh, we keep emphasizing that to do good analytics and to deliver on artificial intelligence, we need good supply of data. And where do we get the data is really from the Internet of Things, the sensors, the devices, the hardware devices that's translating this data. Uh, in DHL, we see IoT being applicable in three broad categories. So from smart operations and offices, really about energy management, tracking of your facilities and your building uh, uh, assets. Um, the second category, category is really shipment and asset tracking, right? Conditioning, monitoring of your shipment, um, asset tracking, shipment tracking of your containers, you know, some form of predictive maintenance as well. Uh, the last category we'll talk about is really last mile and customer interaction. So your smart letter and parcel boxes in which, you know, in, in Singapore as ex really experimenting uh, nationwide parcel boxes, right? Smart parcel boxes. Uh, some of the examples will also be product traceability and integrity. Some of customers are asking for that as well. You know, using smart labels that are attached to your product and, you know, see when the customer opens the product, immediately trigger a signal to, to their inventory to let them know that, hey, their product um, has been open. So things like that are things that like DHL has been exploring and actively being, um, you know, implementing it and uh, within within the whole supply chain of operations. So let me sh again show you a video uh, uh, in the areas of IoT and give you a little bit of introduction of what we are doing. In today's dynamic markets, real-time visibility can provide you with the competitive advantage you need. But reaching a global audience has its challenges. A single intercontinental shipment can involve more than 200 interactions and 20 different players. This is where DHL can help. Whether you want to track a single package, a pallet, a container, or a high value asset, our DHL smart sensors help you stay in control of your supply chain whilst remaining cost effective. Once attached to your assets, the sensors actively monitor your shipment on its journey, no matter the mode of transport. So now, you can sit back and log in to a secure web platform to see the real-time status. 
Live notifications via SMS or email will inform you about any changes in the parameters that matter to you. You decide which parties in the supply chain get notified of any relevant events. Your control tower, manufacturing plant or logistics provider, your customer or even your customer's customer. It's as simple as that. You are now all set for real-time visibility that will help you make better, faster and data-driven decisions and ultimately help deliver your customer promise. As the world's leading logistics company, we take pride in our deep sector expertise, protecting some of the most demanding pharma supply chains for more than a decade. This experience allows us to test, scale and integrate best-in-class real-time monitoring solutions for your supply chain. With our global footprint and network, we leverage economies of scale and provide cost-effective IoT solutions that help you innovate and stay ahead of your competition. I think it's also important to note the next generation wireless networks that are powering these devices. You know, in fact, there's no one size fits all you know, wireless network technology meeting the diverse requirements differing from, of course, use case to use case. Uh, but the next general wireless world will evolve an ecosystem of competing and complementary technologies. You know, so I really like to explore the potential of low power wide area network, you know, especially for a cost conscious supply chain. Um, you know, this, this technology really presents a cost effective and energy efficient way of transmitting information and really still giving you the visibility uh, that you want. So let me sh share with you an active use case, which has already happened and implemented. Um, it's really leveraging on you know, the whole power wide area network uh, powered by the sensors uh, that's attached to this system. So this is a regional warehouse. Uh, as you can expect, it to be a very huge facility operating 24 hours a day. You know, it's an air conditioned environment. And here the challenge is uh, you know, that we are facing a huge cost, especially in our electrical bills. Uh, and we found out incurred from the facility. And what we found out is that the main culprit was actually the operation of our air con systems. So we work with a company called Be Bright um, to help to optimize the use of this air conditioning system. Um, so we leverage on sensors to, to track occupancy within the facility, attach sensors to our air conditioning system to track and optimize them. And in combination with their AI platform, uh, you know, we anticipate changes in weather. So more on you know, a more cooler day, right? The aircon wouldn't have to be working at its full capacity. So dynamically adjusting the air conditioning set points. And what we found out is that this resulted in cost savings. And I give you an, an, an idea of what the cost looked like. So annually, previously we spent about two million a year just on electrical bill because I mean the facility is huge and it's in Singapore. And what we found out that with this technology, we have done a cost saving for about 15 to 20 percent. In a more sustainable front, uh, we we kind of reduce 700 tons of CO2, you know, emitted avoided annually. Uh, the last examples and something that we are you know, really proud of is that DHL's continue to be an active partner in the delivery of COVID vaccines. Uh, you know, our best in class coaching management have allowed us to contribute our expertise in shipping the vaccines. Uh, so our smart sensor teams you know, in the innovation centers are, have been onboarding temperature loggers you know, to ensure the integra integrity of the vaccines, as you will realize, you know, some of these vaccines has to be stored at minus 70. So uh, within the whole transport value chain, we're making sure at the end of the day, there's no spike in the temperature. Uh, so I really want to wrap this up now because of time. And I hope you found these examples insightful. And if you wish to know about some of these trends, you can really download our trend reports online. Uh, we, we try to publish more you know, trends that we find relevant as well. So if you're interested, do have a read on them if you need more information. Uh, we also have four global innovation centers globally. Uh, so we have the fourth one coming up in Dubai this year, in fact, in September, you know, it's, it's building as we speak. Uh, so hopefully when the pandemic is over, we hope to welcome you, um, you know, especially to Singapore. Singapore is on the right. So if you can take a sick preview into how the center looks like. So hopefully when this is over, you know, happy to uh, invite partners and customers, you know, to, to come and chat with us and to see how we can, you know, introduce innovation into their supply chains. Uh, so with this, I've come to the end of my presentation. Uh, so thank you for this opportunity to be able to share with you and I pass the time back to um, Jack. Hello. Hello, hello. Great presentation. I like the videos the most. <laughs> yeah, I like those videos. Let's jump to the Q&A part, shall we? 
Oh. Yep. Oh yeah, yeah. I saw. I saw. I lost you again. Okay. You listen. Uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Let's yes, jump to the first question asked in the chat box. What are some of the challenges when approaching these innovation projects? Would you like to answer that? Yeah, I think uh, you know, championing so many projects in the region and talking to our counterparts, and of course, with all this implementation that you see, with all these videos that you see, uh, the tough part really comes from you know business case, right? Uh, one of the most important factors always cost. When you go to the business, uh, selling them a vision about innovation, uh, the, the first thing they'll tell you, uh, what's the business case? You know, what's the cost like? You know, can that really be implemented? And, uh, you know, especially for robotics, right? Uh, when you go to a slightly more or less, you know, where labor is less costly, uh, robotics are just really, really hard to get implemented in that kind of region. So it's very, there's a, a very wide range of challenges. Of course, it's one factor. Uh, the facility itself, right? Is it a, a empty facility or can the facility be rejigged so that we can fit uh, part of this innovation across the whole operations? Okay. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to remind you, Mr. Zhongguo, there is a one attendee. Keep private message you and uh, uh, just say it in the chat box. Maybe you can answer that later. Yeah, sure. Let's jump to the next question. Uh, how long does it does it to take to implement such technologies? Such, I guess, like DHL technologies. Uh, uh, maybe I think it's you know like for example robotics or even those IoT devices that we have uh, implemented in operations. Uh, to be very honest and transparent, it could take as fast as three to four months to even a year or two years. Uh, so if you see an example of the Locust Robotics, you know, it took us almost like one to two years to really trial it within our operations, um, make it available before, you know, as a business, they decide to invest so many and buy so many hardware into the operations. So it really depends on, you know, how easy the implementation is, how, um, how complicated the integration needs to be integrated into our internal IT systems, right? As, as, as you know, in all big major companies, IT integration is always one major part of doing innovation. Uh, with IT security and, and all the various parts. So, um, yeah, so it, it could take as, as quick as three months to even one to two years, yeah. Anyway, but this is, it is the time to start doing it, right? Yeah. It's a great time, right? Great year to start doing this. Yeah, anyway. you know, in fact, because of the, the pandemic, right? I mean, yeah. innovation and digitalization is increasing even more important now, right? You, you can't really run from it, yeah. Let's jump to the next question. Uh, we still got some time, I guess. Yes, I can have one last question. What are yeah. some of the other trends that DHL have looked uh, or looking into? Uh, I mean, besides the technology, the technological trends that are really cool. I mean, I think you guys are also familiar with like AI, you know, drones and stuff like that. But I think some of the other trends that now we are really looking is the future of work, right? Um, it's, to us, it's very interesting because uh, with the pandemic, people are all working from home. How does that look like and how does that will affect businesses and also the supply chain? Uh, people are now working more from home. And and just this week, right, I'm sure most of you have bought something online. I mean, I, I admit that I bought something online. Uh, so people are buying more online. You know, e-commerce will continue to be a boom. Uh, in fact, choose to be told. Uh, you know, and things like sustainability as a topic becomes in increasing more important. It is it's really part of our mission and goal and a target uh, to really reduce uh, zero emission, especially for a logistics company that have planes, vehicles on the roads. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, because of the time limit, uh, we have to stop your presentation right now. But uh, don't forget, uh, dear attendees, you still have the time to uh, contact our uh, speaker, Mr. Zhongguo, on the event platform, right? You can private message it. A private message to Mr. Zhongguo or leave a message open, uh, leave an open question in the chat box. Zhongguo is going to take a look at those questions. And yeah. Zhongguo, thank you for your time today and looking forward to see you in our next event. Thank you, everyone. Keep safe. Thank you. You too. Bye bye. So, uh, everyone, let's go back to our agenda. All right. Thank you for. Uh, Mr. Zhongguo, uh, for his great presentation. And then next one, let's welcome. Let's welcome the experts from Elite Robot, Ms. Ren Yi, Vice President of Marketing and Overseas Sales. 
and she's gonna talk about how Elite Robot empowers manufacturing intelligence. And let's welcome Rainy. Rainy, I just make you as a presenter. Please try to turn on the message. I mean, turn on the uh, camera and microphone. Hello, Rainy. Ni hao. Hello, ni hao. Hello, everybody. Glad Hello, to see great. you here. Yeah. Uh, think, uh, even I have your presentation slides. Now, please try mm -hmm. to uh, share your screen and share your presentation slide so we can have a better uh, image from your presentation slide and the videos. Okay, okay wait me for a while. It's very interesting. Uh, you're, you're actually presenting in a factory. Yes, yes. Um, a so robot they're... factory. <laughs> yeah, this is our factory in Suzhou, uh, which is located in Jiangsu province. And it's also quite close to Shanghai. Everybody here, Shanghai, right? Of so course. I think today it's a very, um, a very good opportunity, and I sincerely thanks for the support by Rinia and your your professional service, and also the organization. So we we think it over. How can we show to the audience because they taking their time and stand uh, sit here and listen to my presentation. So I want to give them some real stories. That's why That'd we uh, sit here, okay? Okay, one reminder before I go. Please, uh, yeah, hide the, the bar, yes. And also, uh, full screen of your presentation slide. That'd be yes. great. You have the floor. See you later. Dear attendees, don't forget, this is your chance to ask more questions to our elite robot experts. See you later. Okay, thank you. And now it's our turn, and we will introduce you who we are and what's our product. First of all, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm Ren Yi, and English name is Iris. Currently, I'm in charge of global sales, uh, sorry, overseas market business and uh, sales. And also, I'm uh, in charge of the marketing in China. Uh, so I'm quite, how can I say, quite crowded uh, responsibilities. But I love to be one part of the member in Collaborative Robots because it's a booming business and a lot of people talk about it. So in today's presentation, first of all, to answer your questions, uh, who we are, what's your product? So let me share, share you the screens. Elite Robot, although uh, the name sounds a little bit new for a lot of people, for collaborative robots, but actually we have long history. Between 2000, up before 2017, we had the wide range of products strategy. At that time, we produced various products, including the lacing robots, welding robots, six axis industrial robots, Sora. We even um, pr produced our own and 3D vision. So you can see that we have ambitions to be the professional company in the industries. But uh, sometimes business is tough because you couldn't do er you couldn't do everything. Then it makes you nobody. So after 2019, we made a big decision that we phased out all the industrial robots because, as you see, the traditional industrial robots, um, they face very uh, heavily competition. And uh, we want to focus on the robots only. So that's how you look at Elite. And we are a designer and a manufacturer of collaborative robots only. So give you a graphic to make you quickly understand uh, what's the generation of our product? Before 2018, we even designed and produced the first seven axis cabots in China. But unfortunately, it's not a very good commercial product because seven axis is not widely used in many uh, industrial um, scenarios. So after that, we, uh, we promoted our existing generation EC series. Currently, we have three kilograms, six kilograms, and 12 kilograms payload. So it can cover low, medium, and high payload of most applications. Um, certainly, we are not only satisfied with existing product line, and we want to, um, we want to show our ability of innovations. So that's why we invest a lot on R&D. And then next year, we will promote and launch the new generation which is called Carbot Superior Series. Um, it looks a little bit like the, um, the benchmark of the Carbots, and later I can explain. Okay, first of all, please uh, watch a video and I can explain you some more details.
we display some typical applications by the carbon. The first one is hybrid robotics, which interpreted by an AGV with SLAM technology, come from JIG Plus, and uh, also our carbon arm and the 3D camera. And this kind of material handling application is commonly used uh, for a lot of end users, including 3C electronics and automotives. Palletizing application is integrated by the carbots with 12 kilograms and the lift kit and also an, a vacant sucker by Schmatz. Okay, the next one is assembling application. You can see the carbot is doing the multitasks. It inserts the component on the PCB bot. Okay, school driving is also very popular with high tuck and the small tuck. For example, people use it to uh, tightening the screw on the, on the engine, automotive engine, or the small components. And the dual arms application, one is, uh, one is carrying a camera, the 2D camera, and then the other is doing the pick and place work. And for this one, it's simulating a kind of work that the cardboard carrying a cable and insert the cable on the device. And the machine tending uh, is with dual arms and the one arm is to uh, take the, uh, how can I say, load the uh, objects and the other is to get up. And also we have biking, a welding application. Okay. Due to the scale, I'm not able to go through all the videos, but if you have interest to know more, please leave your message or your email address, then we can contact you later. So just as what I mentioned, uh, Cobalt is not a new technology. Actually, it has already developed for more than 10 years. And uh, usually we use it for industrial uh, applications, such like screw driving, polishing, material handling, with, and, and also you can add some sensors, like four sensors or vision sensors. Um, but within these years, uh, more and more people try to use it for some B2C industry, like uh, the people use it to make the automatic uh, coffee machine and the ice cream machine, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I believe that uh, for the carbots, it's a very open um, product and it gives a lot of imagination of the users. We have already had successful stories in China with many famous names. You can see that Foxconn, ZTE, um, they are all giants company in China. And uh, uh, simultaneously, we also work with some automotive accessories and parts manufacturers like Lia, Bosch, Nissan, Toyota. Some people ask me that, hey, Aris, could you please explain the difference between industrial robots and uh, the collaborative robots. I'll give you a graphic to quickly uh, answer it. Uh, due to the background of industrial robots, we still be uh, traditional industrial robots, we still believe that it's quite suitable for some scenarios with high speed, high sessions, or heavy load. And uh, uh, especially for the uh, welding, uh, welding robots or the palletizing robots, they can do some uh, very dangerous work and uh, but uh, but it's not suitable for the collaborative robots i want to emphasize that collaborative robot is designed to replace for humans so if the work couldn't be taken by the humans we need to consider maybe the speed is too fast or the payload is too high i always say that there's no perfect uh, product which can 100 percent cover all the requests so we need to think about how to take advantages of collaborative ro robots like safety, efficiency, in, uh, easy to use, and flexible. To, uh, to introduce you something more about our company, uh, we are a medium-sized uh, company currently with 130 staff. And in 2020, we have already sold 1,000 pieces, uh, 1, pieces uh, in the whole year. Although comparing with the traditional industrial robots, the number is not amazing, but I still proud of the performance because in 2019, we only sold 50 pieces. Things at that time, uh, we focused on the traditional industrial ones 
and the car bus just occupies a small part of the business. But you can see the fast and the um, incredible speed, increased speed of the car bus. So I think, uh, including me and my colleague and also our distributors, they all have confidence on the future of the car bus. One more thing I'd like to mention, because finally the end user, they pay for the car bus. But we always know that they don't pay for only a cobalt arm. They pay for the total system. So a cost-competitive uh, cobalt solution is very important. And most of them, they have to think about ROI. And due to the negative uh, advantages of our labor costs, um, independent research and design, etc., etc., we are able to make the ROI. Uh, within eight to twelve months, but it it depends on uh, which kind of applications. In Shanghai, we have our innovation centers, and currently I stay in Suzhou, and uh, our factory is here. And certainly, we also have the subsidiaries in Beijing and Shenzhen. One good news is we just funded our United States subsidiaries in this April. So you can see our business is not only exists in China but worldwide. We have already had our networkings um, in Europe, like uh, in Germany, Portugal, Poland, and also we have distributors in Thailand, Malaysia, and also very reliable partners in Japan and Korea. But today, taking these opportunities, I sincerely welcome you to join us. No matter you play the role of end users, system interpreters, or distributors, I believe we are able to find the right module to cooperate together. Um, one more thing about the milestone of our financing. Uh, in the beginning of this year, in the quarter one, we just closed uh, the B1 round financing. That means we have healthy cash flow, and uh, from now on, we will keep on uh, investing on the R&D, and as well as um, the promotion and the investment in overseas market. So it's quite, quite good news for everybody here. Okay, that page, I uh, want to show you our technology, uh, sorry, our, our technical um, abilities, okay? So I think uh, I take one minute to explain the business module. As what I just mentioned in the beginning, we are a company focused on the design and the produce collaborative robots. But as you see, finally, the end user start, they are only able to afford for uh, workstations then who will play the role in the middle of it? So distributors and the system in integrators, they are very key person in the total circle. And also including our ecosystem partners. Then the teamwork, after the teamwork, uh, we are able to complete our workstation and the deliver to the end users. One more thing we want to mention, elite, we don't play the role of system integrators. We hesitate on it to tell the truth. Because for some projects, you are not able to get rid of system integration, integration work. But we understand that only concentration can make us survive and be successful. So for some key accounts projects or very complicated projects, we still play the role like system integrator, but we never do the business directly with the end user, but all the business will go through via our distributors and SI. Okay, to explain something more about our team. Um, our team is combined with uh, two groups. One is the old group and the other is the new one. For the old group, our founders, they all came from the university. They are very famous professors and uh, later they give, it, give up their uh, stable work and select elite be their career. And including me, my colleague, uh, Song Ling and Charles, we all came from Universal Robots. It's a famous name. I still respect the experience in Universal Robots, and I also learned a lot there. Uh, but finally, we select, select private Chinese enterprise to start our career because we believe that collaborative robots currently, they are just a small piece of cake of the total industrial robots uh, market. In order to um, enlarge the business, it's better that we understand the requests of the end users. We understand how to take advantages of these products. And what's more, we should have very strong 
cost-competitive, stable, and、uh, scalable product to make it happen. So now it's the、uh, amazing part. I love it so much. It's about our products and applications.、Uh, just as what I mentioned, we have two very clear product a、uh, product、uh, portfolios product line. One is EC series. It's the existing one, and we have had made successful stories with it for more than、uh, two, almost three years. It's cost competitive, comparing a lot of international brand, and it's capable and also it's reliable. I think that's the three factors、uh, which is essential for the end users. Otherwise, they will not pay for a beautiful product, but、um, get a lot of troubles, right? And for the CS series,、um, it is full of expectation. CS means carbon superior, so we hope it can be more superior, scalable, safer, and sustainable. And、uh, for this product, we also change some designs of the hardware and also the software. For example, this generation we will use Python as the、uh, programming language, and for the existing、uh, generation. Currently, it supports Lua and the JBI as the programming language. <coughs> That's the specifications with main data of our product: three kilograms, six kilograms, and twelve kilograms.、Um, it with、uh, they are with a reasonable working range, and also the repeated positioning accuracy can reach、um, plus or minus 0.03 millimeter. So that's why I say it's capable because you know for a lot of applications such like a pick and place, you don't really need advanced or superior carbons to do it. Otherwise, you will think about which one will be the efficient and economic solutions. Okay,、um, we said that the philosophy of the this product is to replace for the tasks by human beings. So, sixty、uh, percent to seventy percent of the work by carbots is pick and place. That means it take a material, it take an object, and the transfer from point A to point B. And also, it can do some、uh, work with the special end effectors like assembling, screw driving, gluing, welding, and also palletizing.、Uh, we have most of the customers come from electronic industries. Um, automotive parts and accessories, but why we joined the event here because we see more and more customers such like P and G, Unilever. They take robots to do some pick and place work or palletizing work. So we believe for this kind of industry like、um, food, cosmetics, and beverage,、uh, there are also big potential for this new technology. Okay, some more videos to give you、um, a vivid picture about how the、uh, how about the cars. The left one is driving Volkswagen factory in Shanghai. The、uh, for this application is with high tech, and the right one is、uh, the carbot carrying a 2D camera to do the inspection work for the automotive lightning. Um, this kind of product, they have some features like medium mass, but、uh, various types. As you see, for、uh, for different brands of the auto,、uh, auto, they have different class or types. So the design of the lantern is also different. So they need a flexible solution. The engineers can easily、um, change the the pro programming and let it to do another work. And three C. For the CC application, I put three videos here to explain you two situations of、um, cobalt application. One situation is in the space, the pe the people they really come in. That means、uh, it's relatively an isolated、uh, place, and the、uh, the collaborative robots they don't need it to show its safety function. But、uh, usually in this kind of application. The cobalt they only have a very limited space to deploy it, so that's one of the advantages of cobalt with compact structure and a, a relative small design. So it's suitable for the old factories to upgrade their automation and replace for the human beings. When you see the middle, and the the video in middle, 
you can see that in this kind of application, it really showed the human collaborative, uh, human robots collaboration. In this kind of work, uh, the workers have to work with a uh, robot in a very uh, in a very short distance. And for this kind of work, I don't believe in this traditional industrial robots they can do it because it's too dangerous. But robots, it doesn't need any safety fence, and uh, they can meet such requests. Machine tending, we use I/O uh, connection to connect the machines and the uh, and the robot. It's quite traditional application. And also for this medical one. Uh, for this case, we use a special soft uh, gripper. Since the end user have a request that when you look at their product, it was wrong the shape and not easily to be caught. And also, they hope that um, the the cupboard will sorry the, the the solution will not scratch the surface of the product. So finally, we select the uh, soft gripper as a solution. An AGV plus uh, cobot is also quite quite popular, and uh, in some 3C OEM in the uh, OEM enterprise, we can see that they use this kind of solution for the CNC machine tending. But we believe for lo logistic also some chances. Okay, next two application is a little bit special. It's not that common uh, for most of the users. The left one is used by China, a nation grid company. So you can see they use the cobot to do the remote control work. And it can replace human being to maintain the high voltage li line. Um, for this application, we worked very, very closely with the end users for more than 10 months. Uh, 10 months and helped us to design a custom uh, tailored product. And for the one, uh, on the right side, um, it's like an uh, autom automatic carpet driver, which can which can handle the ex uh, excavator directly. Uh, what's interesting is we designed the end effectors uh, with a manufacturer uh, because you can see that the controller of this uh, vehicle is round, and you need a special gripper to handle it. Certainly, we also have experience to drive the helicopter. And uh, in this video, obviously, you can see that the cobot is lightweight, right? And also, it can work with the uh, humans very closely. So there's also a man uh, working here. Uh, he is controlling the cobot to drive the helicopter. So quite interesting. So uh, why I show you this kind of applications? Because certainly we want to do the business and to uh, repeat uh, the, the projects in the applications. Uh, and and the, uh, on the other side, we also keep on innovation and we try some special cases to polish the performance and the functionalities of our product. And one more thing usually the customer will ask is about, hmm, your cobot is easily to use. Then how can we work with your ecosystem? Um, so we have some graphics or videos to show you that, for example, uh, we work with many brands of the visual cameras, like Cognix, uh, SICK, Kins, Omroom, and also you have solutions uh, for the local brand like High Vision. And for the Gripper Enterprise, the famous name like a robotic and on robot, we are able to integrate with them directly. So for us, we understand the end users, they always ask for plug-in and play solutions. So our engineers, we draft our own drive and also have our programming to make the integration by the end effectors more easier. In the uh, first pages, I mentioned that we will have new products in next year. Yes, that's true. <laughs> that's not a bubble. Okay. Although the total uh, schedule is a little bit postponed, but we hope that we will have another powerful solutions for the distributors and the channel partners. So finally, they have two selections, uh, two options in their hand. One option is for existing EC series. It's capable for most of the applications. But if the customer, they need 
uh, some more um, products to replace for the benchmark brand. Uh, I sorry, I couldn't mention the name, but they have another choice. That's uh, CS series. So that's some features of the product. Uh, since it's not officially sold, so I could only list some items. Uh, same as before, if you have interest, you get the flyer and the specification of this product. Please message me. Um, this year, I think it's also a tough year due to COVID-19. Um, the overseas traveling is not that uh, freely for everybody. Uh, I think the online webinar uh, give us a uh, chance to know each other. And also, uh, we still have a lot of work to do, such like uh, you can know more details, the parameters, the applications of Elite Robots. And uh, this is not the, not the only time we can communicate. So we hope you can join with us. And later, I will show you a little bit of our factory, OK? So that's my presentation. So let me let me just close it first and then stop sharing the screen. Oh, and the sharing. Okay, that's it. And the, oh, I show you a little bit about our factory here. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Very great. Wow, <laughs> you're showing us the, the background of the factory. Yes, due to the modulized design of joints. The production layout of robot of, of Cobalt's factory is not that complicated. Usually, we do the assembling and the inspection uh, process here. But you can see that we also have our application team. We have a lot of application here. It's like our workshop. And uh, we um, develop some solutions for our customers and uh, for our distributors. OK. That's all the introduction. Really looking great. Really looking great. <laughs> I hope yeah. that uh, our attendees will ask more questions to your background. I, I believe that. I heard that some of them have already private message to you, ask more questions. Oh, thank yeah. you. Anyway, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, let's go to the live Q&A for now, right? Okay. The first question okay. is, what advantages does Elite Cobot theories have over uh, have over others? Okay, I will explain this question from two parts. One is about our design and the technology background. Just as what I mentioned, uh, our cobot is independently self-researched and designed. That means, except the reducer, the key components reducer, uh, we purchased the reducer from a, a famous uh, menu famous vendor, same as Universal Robots, uh, from the same vendor. And for the other parts, like Civil, like uh, and uh, like Encoder, and also the operation system, all of them are designed by Elite. So that means the cost and the quality can be controlled by us strictly. Uh, strictly. And on the other side, we also have very uh, professional and on-time uh, service. As you see, we have a young team. And we understand the service attitude is very important for the um, customers. Some distributors told me that, Aris, if I am representative of your brand, I need to take responsibility and need to um, give good answer to my end users. Uh, otherwise, I will ruin my brand. So I always told them that, no worry, because we care. We also don't want to uh, ruin our brand. So that's why we have on-time service and also currently we offer free of charge online remote training uh usually we are with 20 hours we have our uh, technical engineers to support it and what's more we have rich experience of cobots applications so cobots is combined with two parts one is the technologies and the no, uh, and the and the know-how of cobot of robots so most of the designers, they are able to do it. But on the other side, they need to sync with the brain of the end users. They need to understand the workflow, the processing. So we have this kind of experience from the real cases, more than 20, uh, more than, sorry, more than 200 successful stories. So I believe that we will let not let you down. Yeah, that's the answer, okay. Oh, 
Okay. Hi, Rainka. <laughs> yeah, we've lost you, uh, your connection for a while. Uh, Let's yeah, go to the next one. Okay, okay. Where do you see ro robotic supply chain in the future? It's a really big question. <laughs> and to tell the truth, in the beginning, the people, they, they argue, they argue that why carbon uh, is a suitable technology for logistics for the supply chain. Because we see that uh, there's many AG, successful AGV cases, but for the for the carbots, it's not that um, that much. So I think usually the, the the reason is because for some processing, it's need high speed. Just as what I mentioned, if the circle time is quite short, if the speed is too high, maybe it's not that suitable for the carbots. But please don't forget that now the consuming trend become different. And everybody, when they make the order, it's a special order and it's a customized order. And the day, uh, usually in the supply chain, in the logistic warehouse, the people need cobots not only to fetch the products, but also need to recognize and understand that different different products. So for the collaborative ones, they have some advantages uh, with the open platform. And uh, you can also teach the, the cobot to let them understand um, how to handle these materials. For example, if today you're carrying an egg, you have to be very careful and use a, um, how can I say, a appropriate uh, force to pick it. But if you carry some box, then mm, it doesn't matter. So I think this kind of flexible products, um, they are able to handle some difficult uh, situations. Yeah, that's, just, that's my answer. Okay. That'd be great. Okay. Because of the time issue, I guess uh, we can stop the presentation right now. And okay. attendees, later we're going to have another factory tour video sharing uh, uh, in the next two more sessions. So please okay. looking forward to it. And thank okay. you for Rainy for your time today joining. Thank you. Yeah, it's very great. And you're looking good today. Really good. Thank you. I uh, well prepared today. <laughs> well prepared. And yeah, I believe yeah. that attendees are very interested to your background of factory. And let's see, okay, uh, let's look for more uh, mm -hmm. later in the factory tour session. Thank you for your time. Looking forward to seeing you joining us future events. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Wow, it's good. <laughs> oh, it's more clear. Yeah, great. All right, let's go back to our agenda. All right, thank you, Ms. Ren Yi, for your great presentation today. Let's jump to our next next session. Next session, we'll, we will be having two speakers uh, connect uh, contact us uh, from uh, far away. Mr. Hamasher Stephen, Solution Sales Director of Food and Bell Drives, and Mr. Smith Martin, as the German name, uh, Solution Sales Director, Smart Pallet Handling. They will talk about both uh, on the topic, Advanced Conveying and Pallet Handling Solutions. It's great. And they made a great presentation uh, video within it. And we were going to have live presentation with Mr. Martin. So prepare your questions to him. He will answer your question lively in person. So let's welcome them. Hello, my name is Stefan Amacher. You may know me also as Mr. Drum Motor. I'm the Solution Sales Director for Food and Belt Drives and today I would like to talk with you about food applications. And hello, my name is Martijn Smit. Um, I'm the Solution Sales Director for uh, Smart Pellet Handling Solutions and I'm going to explain you a little bit more about the pellet handling solutions we have uh, in our portfolio. When we are talking about uh, a food application or food factory, we mainly see three uh, areas. So first of all, it's the open food processing area. Then we come into the packed food area. And in the third area, we have the 
pellet handling area where Martijn is our specialist in. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So talking about food applications and food industry at all, what are the current market trends in this area? Yeah, we see in general, uh, Stefan, an interesting question because, uh, you know, Intel is already there for 60 years, so Intel has seen many evolutions in the market. Um, what we are uh, seeing currently in the market, of course, you know, we all order pizzas at night or, you know, some food. So the e-commerce is not just there for the fashion today, but also for food. So you can order anything today, you know, you know, Uber Eats or whatever you, you can do. You can order anything you want. But you can also imagine that this has a huge impact behind the scenes in the logistic area. The complete supply chain there is, uh, is changed the past five years. Well, I agree with you. Definitely in the last year, in the last uh, 13, 14, 15 months since we are in the pandemic, I have also experienced myself that I have changed my uh, behavior of ordering even when it comes yeah. to food. Yeah. So what are the consequences? out of that? Well, you, you see in general in the complete logistic and in the supply chain that um, everybody orders a single piece. I can order tomorrow my glasses and it will be there tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock at my home, my home place. But the impact there is, is huge. Um, because on the other hand, we also see that companies, they don't want to have, to have a lot of stock, for example, not a lot of stock positions. They also want to have new collection every time, you know, maybe 10 collections a year. So. Um, in the complete supply chain, uh, it has an impact on also the investment, on delivery time, on efficiency, on everything. So, and there of course, Interol had some you know, ideas about it, how to solve these kind of solutions. Okay, but what are the unique buying reasons for a customer to use Interol products? Well, first of all, um, Intro is already there in the market for at least 60 years. So we have built up a certain reputation. You can see that we have uh, invested and are still investing in all kinds of plans around the globe to make all the products available in all countries. So that's, of course, something we have a very solid house to say to build up our innovations on. And the past years, we are listening to the customer. We listen to the pain of the customer to try to find out, okay, what is happening? What is going to happen in the six months or in the two years or in the five years in front of us? And we have listened to this also the past five years. So we came up with a complete program um, of solutions um, based on a complete platform strategy we have. So everything that we do in intro, first of all, it is a proven concept. We have a long-term vision and this we combine and we have like, you know, this very innovative products as well. But if we talk now a little bit more into the, in, in the food processing uh, area, what's happening over there? And then specifically about the hygienic part, because I wash my hands like 10 times a day, but I can imagine, you know, in factories, it will be a different kind of process. Well, when, when we are talking about your right um, uh, food application, I would say the pellet handling is at the end of the yeah, line. Yeah. So let's start at the beginning. And uh, this is actually the area where I'm also very familiar with. So when we are talking about the open food processing area, we are talking um, about um, the area where the food is not protected by a package. So a food product may be lying directly on the conveyor. Completely open. Completely like open, yeah. yeah, because it gets processed in there. So it doesn't matter if we are talking about meat, um, poultry, seafood or vegetables and fruits or even bakery. Um, Things. So each of these different food products, they ha are differently risky uh, regarding the contamination with microbial contaminations and pathogens. And here, when we are talking about hygiene, it is always, um, I would say, a fight against the contamination of pathogens. So pathogens are actually bacteria which make you sick. And um, a fruit producer does not want to have pathogens mm -hmm. Yeah. in his food yeah. product. So what about the, the, the shelf life? How, how does it work then? I mean, can you so deepen out a little bit this exactly. process? Exactly. So the amount of uh, pathogens which are inside a food product like before mm -hmm. it gets packed and sealed is somehow an indicator of the shelf life. So if you have a highly contaminated mm -hmm. food product, you will have a very short shelf life. That makes sense, yeah. So, and shelf life is very important nowadays. We are talking about e-commerce food. If you are able to provide a longer shelf life, you can also reach mm -hmm. markets which require a longer transportation distance 
much easier than if you have a product yeah. which has a very short shelf life. So this brings the food producers also some flexibility. Yeah. But on the other hand, and this is <laughs> for me personally the most important thing, um, if I want, if I buy food, I do not want to have uh, any microbial contamination in it because yeah. it is a risk to get sick. Yeah, that, this is an interesting subject. But how, how can we avoid these kind of things? How can we like, do we have solutions for that? Or? Well, um, when we are talking about a hygienic food process, I always say we, we, we need to think about two different things. First of all, the hygienic design of the equipment mm -hmm. where the food isn't getting in contact with. And secondly, and this is something many people do not really consider very often, this is the hygienic process. Okay, but can you describe the design a little bit more? Is it to explain a little bit better? So what is hygienic design? Very simply said, everything which can be cleaned in an easy and efficient way is in my opinion hygienic design. So, so cleaning the table in your opinion is like? Surface okay. and is easy yeah. to wipe and flush down. Yeah. Yes, then I would say the surface at least is a hygienic design. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the type of equipment mm -hmm. if it is a good or bad uh, hygienic design. So as an an example, when I'm talking about the drum motor, here we had really yeah, a lot of uh, innovative ideas to make this to a hygienic design. Mm -hmm. So we have a drum motor which has been designed according to EHEDGE regulations. EHEDGE is the European Hygienic Engineering Design Group where experts come together yeah. and they write regulations of how mm -hmm. should a hygienic equipment look like. Mm -hmm. And what we have done here, for example, we have very smooth surfaces. We do not use any screws or any, any edges where dirt yeah. and debris could catch on. Between the end housings, we use a hygienic sealing which close the metal on metal gap. So as efficient as possible, if you don't have a gap between two metal parts, there is no risk for debris or also microbial mm -hmm. growth to, to get into this gap. And all these things together combined with the way that the electric motor is inside the drum, mm -hmm. completely hermetically sealed with an IP69K sealing system. That means that you can even um, clean the drum motor with high pressure water jets up to 80 bar um, pressure. This makes the complete drum motor okay. Um, very, very um, hygienic. So there is no oil inside? Nothing at all? Or is it like oil free? What is it? Traditional um, drum motors in the past, uh, um, still today, are uh, equipped with oil. Mm -hmm. But you are right, um, there is also a risk which uh, cuts or end users and food producers do not want. They do not want to have foreign bodies or, or external contaminations, for example, from lubricants. Mm -hmm. Here, we use permanent magnetized rotors inside a servo motor, mm. which is very energy efficient. And due to the fact that we generate a way lower heat losses like comparable other um, motor technologies, we do not have any heat issues. And this allows us to um, execute a drum motor completely oil-free. Okay. And simply said, yeah. if you have no oil in your drive, you cannot have an oil leakage. And that means it is 100% impossible that you have a contamination with lubricants if you okay. use an oil-free interval drum motor. So it's also good for the maintenance, I can imagine. But um, can you a little bit explain me about the hygienic process then, a little bit more in detail, or the hygienic how does it work? The hygienic process is actually very interesting and um, the, the, the way of thinking in this way is quite unique and yeah. new. <coughs> so we at Interroll started in 2019 to have a look into the food market. Mm -hmm. So we want to um, set up our, ourselves a little bit wider into the food industry, especially the open and hygienic food uh, industry. And we visited a lot of end users and we asked the end users, what are your pains? What are problems and issues nobody has ever looked at, nobody has ever solved so far? So we were able to collect a lot of things and especially here in the meat, poultry and seafood industry, we saw a, a lot of potential for new developments. So when we had a look at their pains, we analyzed it and we, were, we very often could see that these pains were generated mm -hmm. due to bad processes which were somewhere before happening. 
And I think the very unique thing and the very unique approach we are currently have at Interroll is that we as an intralogistic company are not only looking to find a technical solution to move something from A to B, we also consider microbiological issues mm -hmm. into that and I believe and I have not seen it so far that any, uh, let's say, machine building intralogistic company mm -hmm. has combined these two worlds with each other and our let's say target or our vision mm -hmm. for the future is to yeah, reuse microbial contamination by a smart mechanical intralogistic solution okay so that means also then for your complete oee like you know your your, your mm -hmm. uh, uptime from an installation this you will save a lot of time and a lot of well money then basically because you have a mechanical solution um, instead of the co complete cleaning process you need to do normally during the day, which costs a lot of time, right? As I already said earlier, what the end users do not want to have is mm -hmm. uh, pathogens or microbial contaminations. Yeah. So what we have seen is, what is the current solution to okay. overcome this? Um, the current solution are chemical cleaning agents. Mm -hmm. So, but it can be also seen in the industry that these pathogens, that these bacteria, are getting more resistant against cleaning agents. Yeah. And also future legal requirements like the EU regulations will become also stronger. Later in 2025 for the poultry industry, mm -hmm. there will be um, yeah, a huge increase on the requirements. And I personally believe that um, you cannot um, get these legal requirements uh, fulfilled with chemical cleaning agents. Yeah. Because what is the, the outcome at the end? Um, if you have a microbial contamination, then you need to increase the chemical aggressivity. Mm -hmm. And what happens out of that? Um, your equipment lifetime will go down because plastics, elastomers will be damaged by these aggressive yeah. cleaning agents. So therefore, we said we need to go a different way and we have to solve mm -hmm. these issues okay. mechanically and not chemically. So I do feel that Interol is working on some new things there. Can you, you know, disclose some information about some new developments we are heading for? Because you have a lot of experience, you explain a lot. So anything you can disclose already to me? Or is it top secret at the moment? So at the moment, unfortunately, I have to say it's still top secret, but um, I can promise you we will come up with some very interesting new developments, things the market hasn't seen before, and it is planned to be launched next year, so I can only recommend you keep an eye on the Interroll website and have a look for our new solutions we will come up next year. Okay. Well, Mr. Drum Motor, thank you. It's very interesting information, thank but you. I will talk to you directly, hopefully not by the website. But is this, um, what happens afterwards? I mean, now we have this processed food, it's, it's somewhere still, is it already in the box then? And what happens afterwards? What is the process behind this? Yeah, so um, as I already mentioned, the open food area is a very hygienic and risky area. So here here um, the, the risk that the food gets polluted is very high mm -hmm. and then there's a certain point we call it the primary packaging area where the food product gets into the package and gets sealed. From that point on there is a protection around the food and let's say the hygienic requirements in this area where the packed food is transported is lower. Mm -hmm. But still here end users uh, require stainless steel conveyor technology simply because it may happen that maybe a package gets damaged and some food leaks out and then occasionally this equipment also needs to be cleaned way lower than it is in open food area but still there is a certain demand on it. And when we talk about the primary packaging we normally assume or in most cases you have the single food product yep. Packed, yep. and then you have normally very small unit loads which is then moved on a conveyor and here you normally require a very closed conveying surface for example you can use a modular belt in here and here you have to be also flexible you, you have to go straight up down or in curves uh, through your plant depending on mm -hmm. on the on the room you and the space which is available and then you come to a so-called secondary packaging process where the single units, the smaller units, may get packed into mm -hmm. a carton yeah. box. And here, um, this is an interesting 
area as well. As soon as you have a defined carton box with a defined size, mm -hmm. um, this can be then transported via roller conveyors. And uh, what type of roller are you using there? I mean, it's like. Yeah, so what we can offer here, what we have in our portfolio, these are rollers, uh, we call them EC5000, this ah, is the that's series. An interesting one. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, in combination with a <coughs> multi-control, we, yeah, we are able to build roller conveyors, which can be used with zero pressure accumulation. So zero pressure accumulation means that you have defined zones with rollers, yeah. which are more or less as big as the size of your package and you can accumulate boxes on your roller conveyor but these boxes will not touch each other so you this is a very gentle handling of the boxes but also this is a very energy efficient way of handling the boxes because you only require energy mm -hmm. when the box really has to move as soon as the box stands yeah. still you do not require energy and okay. in combination with this zero pre pressure accumulation technology, um, you can bring the carton boxes to the end of the line. And here we come then to the area to my where box. these boxes need to get uh, put on the pallet. And once they are on the pallet, I would say um, we enter the palletizing world. Yeah. And maybe you can say much yeah. more about this. Interesting interesting uh, process that you just explained and it's again it's like you know it's, it's 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 one story so then we come from the box we go into the pelletizer and this pelletizer of course can be like a robot pelletizer it can be a layer pelletizer uh, you have all kind of equipment to stack the pellet and from there of course we go into the um, uh, you know it's all on a pellet yeah? you have wooden pellets you have plastic pellets and there intro has a lot of solutions that's correct but uh, why intro what makes it what makes intro different in the pallet handling world? Well, first of all, um, intro is in the market for six years. We said this in the beginning where we start, you know, discussing this topic. Um, so we have a lot of experience of material handling in general. And um, we've seen that we have been, and we, we are, and we are getting even more, being very successful with our modular pallet platform for MCP. And what we did now is we uh, asked to many, many customers, like, say, what about if we bring pellet handling to you as well, with the same kind of quality and the same kind of maintenance, the same kind of easiness to install the products. And then uh, many of the customers said, yes, yes, it could be interesting, but intro, you will be the last in the market, so do your best. And I think the past years we have shown that we have a fantastic, great platform, which can be also again connected again with the multi-control, for example, but also there in this platform we can use like 48 volt technology. Well, me as an electrical engineer and a very technical driven person, when I hear pellet, I'm mm -hmm. thinking about 1000 kilograms, 1200 kilograms, you just mentioned 48 volts. Mm -hmm. So how can you move such a heavy load yeah. in an efficient way? Well, and specifically efficient way, because you do not want to move a pallet of 100 kilogram uh, on, a, on a conveyor which is preserved for 1,250 kilogram. So we have a complete range of products where we can transport pallets for, uh, with different applications. And again, you need to know, um, first of all, is it for buffering pallets or is it transportation of pallets? I can imagine if you move your pallets from the processing food area to a, a, a warehouse, warehouse you need driven conveyors and when you are in this warehouse you have like all kind of possibilities if you have a big warehouse you can put the pellets on the floor but you can also move them in some rackings like and then you can use like our dynamic storage part the pellet flow so with gravity let and you know mother nature is existing already for decades centuries <laughs> I mean more than centuries so we know how it works if you if I drop this it will fall on the floor that's a fact right yeah. If you have a pellet on a certain slope, it will go easy and with the right products we have, we can buffer pellets in a very, very high density uh, position and area. So with pellet flow, it is the most easiest way to store your pellet. Of course, the quality of the pellet is of importance that it should be good. And do you have some references you can name? We have thousands of references in pellet flow. I mean, pellet flow is a product we have over decades in our program. We have installed them all over the world 
from New Zealand to, to the Nordics, from, you know, in Australia, in Asia, everywhere. So we're working with the biggest company in the world. The biggest companies, beverage companies in the world, are using our pellet flour. So, again, a product which has its, it's a proven concept and still very, very successful product. Yeah. And when we are talking about electrically driven uh, modules and, and uh, pellet conveyors, so what, are, what is so unique with Interroll to use them? Easiness again, that is one of our major topics. You know, all the products that we develop at Interroll are easy to install, are of course proven, and um, um, uh, we have all kind of different, we even use your drum motor in 400 volt as, a, as part of our solutions. So we have like 400 volt solutions, and most of the time 400 volt is used when you are working with a little more heavy pellets, like saying 1000 or 1250 kilos. If we go to more the lighter versions up to 250 kilogram, we easily use the EC5000 rollers to drive the pellet. And then again, you have a very, very efficient solution. So you can imagine if you combine 48 volt and 400 volt in one installation, because on one side you have empty pellets to be brought away in an area and you have more heavy pellets, you can also combine this. And this combination again, you know, is the magic world, is like the multi-control can both of them control. Well, I can imagine uh, me as a drum motor specialist, one of the uh, very important uh, unique selling points for drum motor is space saving. So I can imagine if you are able to have the electric motor inside the pellet roller, or if you have the EC5000 inside a pellet roller, then you are also very space saving, very narrow with your yeah. pellet uh, yeah. conveyors. Definitely. And then again, it's also quite easy to maintain. First of all, there are interrail products. So we've just discussed that we have done it over the past decades already. And uh, indeed, if you have like uh, the pellet drive or you have like the EC5000 installed in your conveyor, you don't have on the side no gear motors. So also on your maintenance part, you know, we have less maintenance to do because these are all concepts we already have in our program for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, that means what I know from the other products, I can imagine that uh, also the pellet conveyors we have are easy and plug and play or? We can say, and we are working more and more, we see that the industry and of course our, our dear system integrators, our customers are asking for more easy solutions because Nowadays, uh, they want to have uh, um, solutions which they can say, hey, tomorrow, um, or maybe not tomorrow, but next year I want to expand my building. So I want to buy everything. It's like a Lego brick, right? You know Lego. Mm -hmm. You play with it, I play with it. Yeah. In the past, not anymore. But then, of course, you can build all these components together in such a way that it's like compatible, it's backwards compatible. You can, you can, you can uh, very say next year I'm going to extend my building and just, you know, install the new products plug them into the, to the multi-control in combination sometimes with a, with a PLC um, because that, that again, de it's demanding, uh, it's quite, how can I say this, it demands on the, it's quite, uh, the layout is the process you need to start with. You have a layout and from there you, de and de it's demanding, uh, it's quite, how can I say this, it demands on the, it's quite, uh, the layout is the process you need to start with. You have a layout and from there you discuss what kind, of, what kind of possibilities I have? So when, when I hear now all these uh, things about the pellet handling world, and of course I know the world before this area, mm -hmm. we can as a conclusion probably say that Interroll is able to deliver technical interlogistics solutions from the beginning at the open food area, mm -hmm. we can as a conclusion probably say that Interroll is able to deliver technical interlogistics solutions from the beginning at the open food processing area till the end of the line really when the pallet goes onto the truck and yeah. goes to the next supermarket. Yeah. And not just the mechanical part Stefan but also the complete truck and yeah. goes to the next supermarket. Yeah. And not just the mechanical part Stefan but also the complete you know it's, it's a platform based uh, technology we offer to the, to the customers so we can deliver really from A to Z um, and, and this makes it so the modularity, the serviceability, um, we, we can say indeed that we can offer the complete solution. Yeah, that's a good conclusion I can say, yeah. Okay, so thank you. Um, I really learned a lot about uh, pellet handling today and uh, well, very we nice too, uh, to talk to you. Yeah.
that's a good conclusion, I can say. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Um, I really learned a lot about uh, pellet handling today, and uh, well, very nice uh, to talk to you. Yeah. yeah. I don't have to read the book anymore. You explain me everything in uh, this uh, half an hour. So thank you, and uh, I hope everybody you uh, enjoyed our little conversation here, and um, hopefully we can uh, see you again in the next session, or uh, maybe even in the trade show. Thank you. Thank you, and bye bye. What a great presentation, isn't it? Let's welcome Mr. Martin to join us and join the live Q&A part. Martin, would you please try to turn on the microphone, the camera? Yes. Hello, great to see you. Hello. Great to see you, nice to meet you. There are many questions in the chat box, but according to the time, let's select around two questions, two, two to three questions to answer, right? Let's, uh, what about go for this one? Is that okay? What's the future of Intero's drum motor? Oh, it's a big one. Well, you know, my colleague, Mr. Stefan Hammer, who is the big, who is Mr. Drum Motor? He's not available today. He's, uh, he's not there. But um, I think one of the colleagues in, uh, in East Asia can easy, easy also explain what. Anyway, let, let me tell you this. I just seen the factory yesterday again of our uh, drum modes, which we produce in many areas in the world. And one of the locations is here in Germany. And um, what we see actually is that the drum motor is still an, um, an application we, with many, many kind of applications. And, uh, and, and one of them, we, we see an, an oilless drum motor in the future for the food, for the food area. That's fine. Uh, yeah. What about this one? Could you please stem some customer reference for the uh, storage solutions? And uh, what's the advantage of the internal solution? Well, again, we have, like I mentioned in the in the presentation, we have thousands of references along the world. I think one of the most common known, maybe in in Asia, is like Liwayway, which is quite a, an old company which has already for many many years using our material in in Asia, which is I think in uh, in in, uh, in the Shanghai area. And uh, next to that, because we also work work with very very big names around the globe, you know, like the big drinks, like we know, like you know the the soft drinks we have. So we have many applications. And of course, um, using this kind of equipment depends many times on the layout you have. Great. What about, um, oh, I like your background. What's that? Is that animal? No, so no, no. Like say we are best in class. You know, we tried, you know, over 60 years and decades we are in the market. So we have, uh, that's our goal to always have the best oh. performance for the customers. Thank you. <laughs> Great one. Let's jump to the next one. Uh, when do we use full roller pallet flow rack versus the traditional wheel tracked pallet flow? Uh, that's a very good question. I mean, and, and again, you know, these kind of questions um, I like to answer more like in, in a private chat because it depends on the layout. It, it depends on the building. Do you have a high building, a low building? Uh, how many pallets per hour? So uh, if you want to buffer your pallets, you know, it's better to use the racking system because you can save a lot of space in your room, in your buildings. Yo, yeah, so it's a uh, customized solutions, right? Can it's, I say it's, that? It's, it's customized solution with, with, with standard equipment. That's what we aim for. Ah, all the time. I see. So they need your device. Okay, yeah. next one. When do you recommend full roller pallet flow racking? Well, again, if you have like uh, um, uh, the, the flow racking, if, if you have like 2,000, 3,000 pallet places in your warehouse and you want to store, store them vertically, and then I would really recommend to look at this pellet flow solution. So, and then, yeah, with our standard roller conveyors, the big advantage is of this kind of equipment that we have, you don't need any wiring. You can complete it there. Mechanically, you can put it in the warehouse. So for the serviceability and maintenance, it's, um, it's a fantastic solution to have a high density pellet storage in your warehouse. Thank you for that. One last question from me. How long is the time difference between you and me? I think it's um, at the moment it's uh, six hours if I'm correctly right. What time? It's ten to nine. What time is the yeah. time? Oh my god! It's like two fifty uh, in the afternoon. So six now. hours. Ah, six hours. Great. And really, thank you for your joining today. Thank, thank you, you for attending our uh, webinar today, com virtual conference today. Looking really looking forward to see you next time in our future oh. event. Thank you Hope for the you. time, you. for the presentation and the Q&A part today. Have a great really show, thank you. everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Dear attendees, it's great chance to have our speakers from that far away, right, isn't it? 
please seize your chance to ask more questions in the chat box and the uh, uh, attendee uh, platform right now you're having in the conference room anyway. So seize your chance to learn more from our industry experts. Oh, by the way, Martin just sent me his contact information, his email. I will publish later in the chat box. So welcome. If you have any more questions or you want further discussion, contact Martin. Martin, thanks again for your joining today. Now, let's go back to our agenda. According to our agenda, the next one is more exciting. We will going to have a live presentation from Lazada. Miss Ishana Wong, Senior Associate Business, Business Development Seller Service. She will talk about the logistics in e-commerce. Let's welcome she. Uh, let's welcome her. Hi, so I'm Ishana Wong. I am currently the Senior Associate under Lazada Philippines under Business Development Strategic Partners. So right now we're going to be discussing uh, logistics in e-commerce. But actually, before we go into that, I want to share a little bit of background currently on the Philippines and what is the current landscape that we're checking, especially because of the pandemic. So given, uh, especially the start of March 2020, right, we've seen a really huge jump or huge change in behavior of how Filipinos now purchase things. So right now, we already are at a very high 73% of the population uh, who are now shopping online. So before, um, Filipinos are very skeptical in terms of buying online because they don't see the product in front of them. They want to feel it. They want to touch it. And that has always been a challenge for you know e-commerce when it comes to buy, uh, getting new buyers on the platform. But because of the pandemic, right, people can't go out. Uh, people can't buy as simple as they did before. Meaning to say, you know, buying purely off offline, right? And because of the pandemic, they also had to adjust to start, you know, scouting or start purchasing their goods online. And because of that, um, aside from the 73%, right, out of that percentage, we see 1.5 million are totally new uh, in terms of online shopping. So imagine the growth that we're seeing. And also, we're seeing a lot of changes in behaviors and the trust that uh, it comes when like buying online are now stronger than ever. And it's so slowly increasing in terms of, you know, getting consumers to trust more in terms of buying online. So specific to e-commerce, right? We've seen a huge, huge jump in terms of our sales and also monthly buyers. So for our sales, right, before um before the pandemic, we've seen a very healthy year and year growth. But with uh, because of the pandemic, we've seen a huge jump in terms of um the exponential change. And right now we're already seeing 2.5 times um jump in terms of the daily sales versus what we've seen, you know, before March 2020. And of course, the huge jump is also contributed by the new buyers that I mentioned earlier. So aside from uh, the uh, the change in sales, we've also seen a huge uh, jump also in terms of the monthly buyers versus, you know, 2019. You know, we've already projected e-commerce to be a, a huge thing in Southeast Asia. As, and also, of course, here in the Philippines. But, you know, because of the pandemic, we've seen the the timeline for that growth has shortened uh, dramatically. So, you know, we've seen a huge jump in 2025. We've seen the same patterns already this year by 2021. And because of the huge um, change, right, in terms of the consumer behavior, we've seen also a lot of brands and sellers adapting to that. And, you know, we're very happy to announce, like, um, ever since March 2020, like, a little over a year, we've seen more than 2,000 brands, both local here in the Philippines and international brands, have now shifted online. They have now joined our LAS Mall, 
So uh, the trust is definitely there. And under Lasmol, you know, we've seen a lot of consumers very, very happy to see that their trusted brand, you know, being able to purchase them online given the convenience of it all. And of course, um, the safety precautions as buying online versus offline. So around that 2,000 brands, right, we've seen really huge names. We see Sony, we see Lenovo, Innisfree, we've seen Superga, and of course, some local brands here in the Philippines, like Century Pacific Food. So it's a no-brainer. Uh, we've onboarded 2,000 uh, brands, but of course, this is definitely going to increase. If you see your competitors, um, of course, being online, you don't want to be the last one on board, right? So we've seen the trend still continuously growing healthily. And, you know, the assortment that we've seen are now uh, wider than ever. We've seen also in terms of the trust uh, is definitely bigger when it comes to Lasmol. And, you know, as a brand, that's something that you want. You don't want to partner with a platform that doesn't have trust when it comes to consumers because, of course, that will paint the brand that you are already working on. So the question might be, uh, the next question you might be asking is why why with Lazada, right? Like why do these brands partner with us versus other competitors or even building their own, you know, uh, website? So I, I want to start with, uh, I, I want to start that with, you know, marketing definitely. So under Lazada Philippines, we're currently the number one e-commerce platform. So of course we have the majority of the ind industry's market share and that's primarily because of the um, aggressive traffic or marketing that we're doing so you know because of the efforts we actually now have garnered you know 3 million average daily sites every day so this 3 million is definitely growing on a day-to-day -day basis and of course as um, an offline retailer right that's something that you might um, not be able to capture if you are purely offline you have to have a lot of capital invested in your physical stores and the placement of your stores are also very crucial. When it comes to online, of course, this is a factor that's um, something that you shouldn't be worried about because you can sell to the whole Philippines and the assets or the capital invested in this one is not a lot. Um, second, of course, is brand management. So, of course, right now we're the number one most engaged brand on Facebook and slowly getting there when it comes to Instagram. So, we have millions of followers um, and every day, we make sure that we become relevant by having a lot of consumer engagements uh, when it comes to the daily tasks that we have on these social media sites, right? Then lastly, of course, for traffic, uh, we're the top 10 most searched in the Philippines in, in terms of the shopping sites. So that's something that we're very proud of. And, you know, when it comes to the digital age, especially when, when it comes to the internet, right? Uh, having your real estate online is definitely a must, and we're very happy to be able to secure this. So these three factors, of course, benefit, um, the brands definitely benefit from them. And it's interesting because we do have a lot of bu budget, and we will continuously keep on pushing in terms of getting, you know, Filipino buyers or even, you know, general consumers on the Lazada platform. So aside from the traffic, of course, there are other factors to consider. One is definitely easy payment. So we have options like cash and delivery and e-wallets. We have to make sure um, in terms of the array of payment solutions, we are available in those aspects and we are able to get a lot of different consumers with their different you know, financial preferences. Um, second benefit, of course, are in-house logistics. So in the Philippines, right, um, we're the only one that has our own logistics arm. So because of this, it's very much in line with where, uh, which area we want to, you know, explore or which area we want to expand. Um, later on, I'll be discussing the different, you know, setups or the different, you know, um, like options that we have when it comes to logistics. Third, of course, is insured quality. So we have to make sure um, what the customer sees on the app is what they'll be getting. And of course, we have the tools to be able to do this. We have, you know, AI to make sure the keywords before you upload your products, it's already appropriate to, you know, the different categories that you're in. Or if ever you are a brand and we and you want to, of course, make sure that it is uh, only you who have, you know, the sole or exclusive right. We also make sure that um, we limit, you know, um, parallel sellers or sellers that have no authority selling your brand. 
Lastly, of course, we have um, seller support. So all throughout your journey in the first 90 days, there will be someone that you can talk to to make sure your onboarding process and incubation process is, goes very smoothly. So for specific to marketplace sellers, we have no commissions for them. And when if you're a LASMO seller, the commissions are very low and it really would depend on the different categories that you're in. So these four aspects, right, easy payment, logistics, um, insured quality, and seller support, it is the infrastructure that you need to make sure your business online is prosperous. And, you know, when it comes to these four investments, if you were to do your own website, you have to have a lot of um, resources put in there, not only like, of course, cash or the like capital heavy, but also your human resources when it comes to this. So, you know, partnering with Lazada is a very uh, low hanging fruit for you guys because everything's already set up. You just have to upload your products and automatically you will now be able to capture the 3 million daily average customers that are currently going to our platform. So aside from these four things, right, I mentioned when it comes to seller support, there will be a program to make sure you won't get lost when it comes to transitioning online. And within Lazada, we have three major um, benefits that we will share with you guys. So one is store support. So this is basically the infrastructure that I mentioned earlier, the different tech, tech and logistics uh, you know, pro processes that you can already maximize from. Second is brand building. Again, all of the marketing initiatives that we're pushing to, towards you guys, um, this is something that we work on, of course, to make sure there will be new buyers and there will be a lot of top of mind um, initiatives when it comes to choosing for the customers where which platform to use, right? Or which platform to buy from. And lastly, we have consumer engagement. We have to make sure uh, we are always updated we are always, you know, uh, very relevant to our current consumers. And we don't want to be uh, um, purely trade when it comes to the app. We want to be lifestyle focused, right? That's why we have a lot of initiatives like live stream. Uh, we have the different games on our apps to make sure people go to the app, not only to buy stuff, but also to, you know, spend their time, uh, spend their days, you know, if they're bored and making sure that we're there for them as well. So specific to store support, right? When it comes to logistics, we have to make sure we cover all kinds of different, uh, all kinds of sellers, whether they're big or small, and we cater to the different business models that they have. So right now we have four. So we have fulfilled by Lazada, pick up or what we would call drop shipping, drop off, and delivered by seller, the newest uh, addition to our logistics uh, infrastructure. So let's get to it uh, one by one. So for the first one, Fulfilled by Lazada. So this is a setup um, that we we created to make sure the ease of doing business, it's there, right? So in terms of the setup, how it works is basically the seller will be delivering their um, inventory to the Lazada warehouse. And whenever there are, are there is any order, Lazada will be the ones taking care of, of course, the warehouse management, the fulfillment, and of course, the last mile delivery. And after... Um, Oh, so let's say setting it up, of course, uh, Lazada will be handing also the last mile where it will now be delivered to the customers. So as you can see here, the only um, like the only initiative or deliverable by the seller is to transport the inventory to our warehouse so that they can, you know, make sure the inventory keeps on flowing. So this is very beneficial for brands who want to um, outsource or basically have Lazada take care of their fulfillment arm. So uh, we have a huge warehouse here in Metro Manila, but we're also very much uh, present in Mindanao and Visayas area as well. The second is drop shipping. So um, this is basically for um, uh, for sellers that want the their items to be fulfilled by them their own like, team. And how it works is basically Lazada will be uh, arranging for the first mile, and they will go to the seller's warehouse to pick up the items. After that, um, the items will now be distributed to the Lazada sort sorting hubs so that it can now be, um, of course, redirected or shared also to the customers. So this is very easy as well. So if, let's say, the brand has their logistics or um, their fulfillment you know, division set up, no problem. So what, we'll do, uh, what Lazada will do is pick it up from their warehouse and the, the last mile will be up to us when it comes to delivering to the customers. So that's for dropshipping. 
Now let's go to drop off. So these are now specific to where uh, sellers who are interested in you know making sure their time is in their hands. So what will happen is the seller will now be the ones delivering it to the third party providers that we have across the Philippines, whether it's gas stations like Shell or convenience stores like uh, Mini Stop, they can deliver it there. And once delivered there, um, the fulfillment pro process for them is already ended. And um, what will happen now is Lazada will be the one taking care of the last mile. So after the pickup on, uh, after the pickup during the third party providers, um, like different locations, right? It will now be redirected to the Lazada sort hub, wherein of course we will now take care of the last mile and deliver it to the customers. So this is very interesting because uh, the partners that we have in the Philippines are very much scattered and we make sure the radius for each provider or each brand is very much near to, the, to, the, to their warehouse. Lastly, we have delivered by seller. So this is relatively new. During the pandemic, we've seen a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, um, making sure, of course, they uh, protect their capital or protect their expenses. So they, uh, we've seen a lot of, you know, you know, entrepreneurs at home baking goods and selling them on, let's say, social media. And we wanted to, all, of, of course, help them in terms of giving them the traffic that they need. So for fresh and frozen items, we have um, the delivered by seller setup, wherein the Lazada, uh, the Lazada seller or the brand will be the ones taking care of the logistics, either by partnering with a third party or they can have their own uh, fleet in terms of the delivery. And because of this, we are now able to cater to, you know, same day deliveries, making sure the perishable goods co uh, get to the customers um, fresh as possible. So uh, this is also very interesting because we had to make sure our technology is ready for this and we really work fast and quick to make sure this is possible. So this is um, the landscape when it comes to the logistics here, when it comes to um, like e-commerce, right? We have to make sure whatever seller type that you are, whether you're new, whether whichever kind of items you're delivering, whether it's bulky or fresh items, there is a process or there is an option for you to utilize. So just to quickly recap, we have, of course, fulfilled by Lazada, pick up, drop off, and delivered by seller. So that's basically um, logistics when it comes to e-commerce. And that's something that, of course, our brands are very happy with because of their wide range in assortment, right? But aside from the logistics infrastructure, we also have a lot of different uh, benefits when it comes to joining in, in our campaign. So once you're part of the Lazada community, of course, you will also be um, given access to join our mega campaigns. So we have a lot of our shopping festivals. We have 11-11, 12-12. We also have our 9-9. And, you know, during the, these mega campaigns, we've seen uh, six times growth in their sales versus an average day. And, of course, this is because of the traffic that we push via the different marketing initiatives that we have. So if you are interested to be part of the Lazada community, this, uh, the, the access to mega campaigns will be completely free for you to use. And, again, we're putting in billions of pesos to make sure, like, our sellers have the appropriate buys for their items. Aside from that, we also have what we call a flash sale. So think of it as um, your usual sale, but you know, four times or five times much crazier. I say that because um, within flash sale, right, we give access to our sellers to sell more than a thousand of their SKUs in just a very limited period of time. So we've seen, you know, sellers selling more than a thousand units of their, you know, SKU within just one hour. Because, you know, this is a very uh, highlighted portion within the app. And, you know, we've seen big brands selling a lot of the a lot of their items during this uh, module. And, of course, this is, again, something that you can maximize once you join the platform. And it's, again, going to be very much free for you to use. So the traffic here, it goes up to... It goes as high as 14 times your nor normal day performance. And again, this is just one day, uh, and, uh, one day or even one hour in terms of visibility. Right, so um, definitely there are a lot of options or there are a lot of benefits to sell on Lazada. And we're very much excited to have you guys on board. So if you're interested, just uh, quickly scan the QR code or you can even check out the link that we have here 
bit.ly slash last register now and make sure to put the referral code to make sure uh, to get the benefits that we'll be giving it to you guys at the end of the day. So thank you so much for attending this um, session and we're very excited for you guys to be part of the community. If you have any questions, feel free to message me and we're uh, hopefully we see your brand on our platform so that we can help you guys grow. So thank you so much and have a great day. There are many great discussion in the chat box. So let's welcome Ishana Wong. Please, uh, let's go to the Q&A mode and please and try to answer the questions. There are many questions, so I would like to, uh, to pick the questions you would like to answer first, all right? Sure. If you go to Q&A mode, yeah, there are... Yeah, yeah. great. So what are some of the logistics challenges for e-commerce in the Philippines? Right, that, that's a wonderful question. And I think uh, a lot of Southeast Asia countries has experienced this, especially, you know, countries with a lot of islands like the Philippines. So to give you guys a fun fact, in the Philippines, we have more than 7,000 um, islands in the Philippines, and it has always been a challenge. So definitely that's the main thing. So we try to cover it as much as we can. So of course, we develop our own logistics arm. But also aside from that, we partnered with third party logistics to make sure we do cover every uh, every inch of the Philippines when it comes to first mile and last mile. Great. So next one is what is Lazada doing in terms of limiting waste? Right. So, you know, there are a lot of talks, right, especially with global warming in terms of like increasing waste. You know, with e-commerce, we get thousands, if not million millions of orders each day and of course as a big company of course we also have very big responsibilities so now we're actually shifting most of our packaging into biodegradable goods so we have a lot of different options for our sellers to use but all uh, all of them are very eco-friendly and we have to make sure that we're also doing our part limiting these ways good to hear that okay please pick the next one Oh, where do you see e-commerce in the next few years? Right. So very interesting question. So as uh, if you guys don't know, Lazada is actually under the umbrella of Alibaba Group. So given the, the scale of it or, or how Alibaba has uh, improved or basically progressed in the past years, that's something that we're actually eyeing. So now we're very focused on um here in the Philippines only, but you know it's always a possibility to start expanding into other countries as well. So again, like Alibaba has created a really huge, uh, a really great example of like what e-commerce can be, and we're very happy to be part of that group in terms of guidance and what they are doing now. Maybe it's something that we can do in the future. That's a maybe. A great latest market trend, Sharon. Thank you. Would you like to answer some more? Sure, let's uh, answer two more. So we have one, uh, what logistics companies uh, company does the Lazada Vietnam team use? So again, in all Lazada ventures, all Lazada countries, we actually have our own uh, logistics arm, which is the Lazada e-logistics. So there, I'm pretty sure they also have partnered with other local companies, but unfortunately I'm not uh, well equipped since I'm in the Philippines, but definitely uh, Lex is part of them. Right. Okay, uh, maybe uh, because of a time issue, let's answer the last one question, okay? All right, great. So thanks, uh, Jack. So go ahead. Please, please read the question This for All this right. one. All right, so what are your top logistics standards to all your branches in the other countries? So amazing question. So within the Lazada team, we've partnered with, you know, uh, market leaders in terms of like the different techniques, right? So in terms of the standards, it's very important that we cover both first mile and last mile. So first mile is basically uh, capturing the delivery or the items from the sellers to us. Then the last one is from Lazada to the end consumers. So we have a lot of technology here, making sure in terms of algorithm of delivery, what is the fastest route, um, what's the easiest way to get to the customers. And in terms of making sure validating 
each of those checkpoints, we have a lot of you know technology in place. We have a lot of um, barcodes. We have a lot of systems to make sure uh, how or when actually will you be arriving your uh, when your items will be arriving. So in terms of standards, we have of course a lot in place. Uh, I think later on BHL will be speaking, and pretty sure uh, all of the top standards that they're doing we're also uh, following as the best practice. Yes, that'd be great. Okay, uh, because of the time issue, really thank you for joining today. I have to end your sessions now. For those uh, attendees who are looking for a further discussion, welcome to contact our speakers later after this session. And Ishana Wong, please, uh, thank you for joining today. Looking forward to see you in our future event. All right, thank you so much, Jack, and thank you to everyone who joined into the session. See you. All right, back to our agenda. Uh, before we, before our very exciting panel discussion, let's go to the uh, Ili Robot Virtual Factory Tour, shall we? Two years ago, Elite started to plan a new generation of cobots. The launch of the CS series helped to bring our latest understanding of cobots into reality. This is the type of product that exemplifies the state-of-the-art level of the industry. Elite CS series cobots are equipped with multiple patented technologies to enhance safety, which is complied with international standards such as the EN ISO 10218, EN ISO 13849 in ISO slash TS15066. The wrist joints module design of all robots is optimized to further increase the safety of human-machine collaboration. The CS series joint modules are designed in a more advanced way, which can be replaced in just 10 minutes. A brand new single board control system is implanted for better reliability and stability. Update of software and control box, each pendant, joint module, and flange I.O. are fully supported. In addition to hardware improvements, the software of the CS Series Cobots has also been comprehensively upgraded. Elite adopts a new type of lightweight and widescreen teach pendant that supports touchscreen control for more intuitive operation. The programming language is a new robot scripting language that supports standard Python with an excellent scalability and high degree of freedom. The two letters of the CS Series embody Elite's future layout of collaborative robot technology. C is for the initial letter of Cobot which means collaborative robot, and the S stands for safe, simple, superior, sustainable, and scalable. Next, let's take scalability for example to introduce our CS series products. At the hardware level, we provide more digital IOs, including 24 digital inputs, 24 digital outputs, analog inputs and outputs, 100M and gigabyte ethernet. We also provide a more powerful drive capability in terms of hardware. Moreover, we also support Profinet, Ethernet IP, Modbus RTU, TCP, and other mainstream field bus communications protocols. We have a higher system bus frequency of 500 Hz and provide more low-level control interfaces. We define the CS series as a platform-level product of Cobots in an effort to maximize the capabilities of robot manufacturers to provide a safe and flexible collaborative robot products that are the simplest to use. On this basis, we help our clients and integrators to lower the threshold for deploying cobots.
艾利特机器人 EC 六幺二适配依维莱 Lift 升降柱，实现对机器人垂直方向工作空间的扩展。依维莱 Lift 实现了和艾利特安装底盘的适配、电器通讯接口的适配以及软件接口的适配。客户在使用过程中不需要考虑机器人和升降柱之间的机械接口和电器接口的适配，同时可以在艾利特机器人编程软件中方便的调试升降柱。
Okay, what a great video, okay, for virtual factory tour of Elite Robot. As I just mentioned in the chat box, if you have for further uh, discussion needs, please uh, pay also pay a visit to their exhibit booth on your left hand side. Go to XB Hall and leave a message at their booth. Uh, in there are many booths there. You can leave message in each one. Let's go to the next session. Before our panel discussion, very exciting, we will have a live presentation from Ms. Andy Ooi, Chief Executive Officer. He will talk about the 3PL supply chain and Hala logistics. Very interesting topic. I'll uh, make Andy Ooi as the presenter now. Uh, Andy, would you try to turn on the microphone, the camera? That's a camera and microphone too. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, just a moment. I will turn on your presentation slide, okay? All right. It's very nice to see you there. Nice to nice see you too. You. <laughs> All right, just a moment. Is this your PowerPoint slide? Yep. You're I'll right. be there at the back end to assist you. Just uh, tell me how to do it. Thank you. You have the floor. See you later. Okay. You and so dear attendees, don't forget, Seize your chance to ask more questions to Mr. Andy Oi. Thank you very much. Very good afternoon to everybody. Uh, welcome to the chat of this particular summit, uh, sharing about the whole logistic environment for ASEAN. Of course, it's talking about the whole world. Eventually, uh, the logistic is a very integrating, very big uh, logistic platform. Uh, where we are, sh each of the company is sharing of the different area of the services. So before I begin, uh, my name is Andy from Malaysia. I would like to first say that the previous sessions shared by earlier speakers was very informative. Uh, it's very, very well covered for the uh, industry of the logistic requirement. Uh, you got the warehousing, you have the e-commerce, you have the robot for saving on the space of the warehouse as well as manpower and so on. So today I would like to briefly share uh, the big picture of the new area of the logistic, HALA logistic and the three PL services of the supply chain, logistic transportation, environment and its requirement. Okay, next. Next page. Uh, we shall actually begin speak about HALA products. What is HALA product is very, very important. Uh, only the Malaysian and Indonesia, I think is very, very popular. What is HALA product, they understood. But the rest of the other country in the world, they are actually uh, less concerned about the HALA products. Uh, here we have actually to share with you what is HALA products. HALA is used to describe anything permissible under the Islamic law. The production and consumption of HALA food has been traditionally the main focus of HALA product. However, now HALA product also consists of cosmetic, pharmaceutical, clothing, financial services, and even our logistic transportation. Next page. The global interest in HALA logistics, uh, we have, in fact, as of this year, 2021, there are approximately 1.9 billion Muslim population globally. The promotion of the HALA products are becoming significant as is associated with quality, cleanliness, and safety as underlined by the Sharat set of guidelines. Hala products accounts for more than 17% of the world in the food industry alone. Best part is Hala food markets will continue to grow because of the high demand. Next page. The slide indicates 
the importation of the food products alone by some of our common trade countries. For example, UK is importing value of 20 billion UK pound per annum. The China, Japan, UAE and Thailand are set to become the next top importers of food, halal food products. The American halal market alone is estimated to be US 18 billion. This is quite big. At the same time, Brazil as the top second top exporter of meat and poultry to the Muslim majority country after Australia. Next page. Today, my focus is on the most important but also most forgotten area of the halal logistic supply chain industry. Halal logistic is the act of distributing halal product along the halal supply chain. All these phrases of transportation, terminal operation, warehousing, material handling, and procurement are a part of the core logistics and may, must be shared compliance to avoid contamination during distribution. Next page. Why HALA logistics? It is simple. HALA is assisting, extending is in the core value chain and the needs of for HALA logistics is, uh, is to ensure integrity from the farm and manufacturer to the consumer's folk. Next page. Unfortunately, there are many issues and challenges in HALA logistics. Major ch challenges are that there are very few certified HALA logistic provider worldwide to cater for the HALA demand due to high operational costs. As HALA goods need to be segregated from the HALA non-HALA products. And also small volume for now of the HALA products is not enough to consolidate all HALA products in one delivery so the cost of delivery is affected. If this requirement is not complied in accordance with the HALA certifications guide, the HALA certificate will be withdrawn by the HALA authority. Therefore, we have to comply uh, your truck and your warehouse. It must be a HALA product in a certified HALA uh, operation. Uh, that you are not supposed to mix non-HALA product in the same location, uh, whereby the authority enforcement, they will not allow such thing to happen for a HALA certified uh, 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 premises or the truck or, or the shipping container worldwide, eventually. Next page. Unfortunately, sorry for the slowdown, Malaysia is recognized by the United Nations. The UN has says that Malaysia is one of the best country in producing halal products. Because Malaysia has got Yakim, where they have very stringent control over from the very basic uh, product material derived until production and delivery to the consumer. And this has to be uh, complied and operate on such a manner in order to stay as the cleanliness of the product 
to date, Malaysia has an annual export value of 35 billion ringgit Malaysian for halal products, which contributes approximately 5% of the total export for the country. Next page. Hala product is already on the move. It is being reborn into the age of globalization. And it is for everyone, not just Muslim consumer, but non-Muslim worldwide also contribute to the acceptance and consumption of the halal products. It is known to be cleaner, healthy, choice due to its hygiene practices. Next. This show that halal logistics becomes an even more essential requirement to cater to B2B and B2C market worldwide. Eventually, the demand will be a halal logistic compliant end-to-end last mile delivery. In summary, the transportation industry worldwide must develop a complete certified HALA products delivery service. Okay, next. Oh, that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Should you have any question that I am capable to share, please do not hesitate to post your question here. On the screenshot, we there's these slides that you can actually contact me after the event that we can actually elaborate on the requirement, the certification, or setting up, establishing uh, a, a common uh, warehouse for the HALA logistics, uh, three PL services for the delivery end-to-end -end and the uh, comply of this uh, to carry out, for example, the Japan Olympic Village delivery that now has circulated the requirement. Only acceptance of the goods into the village or for HALA certified products, within which they will not allow any non HALA product to access into the Olympic Village. With this demand, I believe the future world that is become very, very important and is big for the logistics to expand into that uh, scenario to meet in order to survive in the business of transportation industry. With this, I would like to thank you once more for your time on this small presentation, outlining a bit about the HALA logistic. Hope that uh, you can uh, post some question that we can actually share uh, to discuss further. Thank you so much. Thank you for the time, Mr. Andy Ooi. Let's yeah. jump to the Q&A. Since uh, the audience are actually looking for uh, the answers of the difference between HALA logistic and the normal one. Let's jump to the first question first. What is HALA logistic solution to high demand of HALA product? Are you ready to answer that? Yes. What is HALA logistic solution? The solution is very, very uh, simple where we have to be integrated with the requirement and be certified to carry out the services of logistic transportation for the last mile end-to-end -end delivery. So the solution is where the transportation already been carrying out a lot of general cargo. Now, however, this HALA product is something new that you have to cater especially for this particular segment of business uh, even though costs can be slightly high due to the volume 
of each country still are not much, but your truck and your warehouse has to be segregated to store or to deliver on, on, the, on the basis of uh, requirement that cost of the operation is a challenge. But however, I think the consumer willing to pay for something that hygiene, healthy, and uh, in, uh, sort of uh, for life, money is uh, important. Uh, health is much, much more important. Thank you. <laughs> Great yes. conclusion. Let's go to the next one. Please read the question and start answering. Yeah. The HALA supply chain necessary for end user of the HALA products. So we are talking about HALA certification, HALA supply chain, where the transportation delivery. Uh, currently, uh, goods are delivered by whatever means. It can be in the, uh, a small little car, they carry many, many small parcels, many small consumable products where it's hala and non-hala. So what is non-hala? Not only because of pork uh, meat that is non-comply, but also uh, products material for any usage that is toxin, that is classified under non-hala. So if you mix around with the food products on one delivery, then it becomes a toxin in mixing with the HALA cleanliness product, which means we have to be ready for that uh, requirement of the service uh, is necessary. So the preparation to migrate into such avenue, I think is very, very tedious that we have to study now or we'll be out of business from the HALA perspective. Uh, in the worldwide, there's a demand that's increasing of the purchases of HALA goods around the world, and we have to be ready to deliver our services in that particular sense. Yes, thank you. Great one. Okay, uh, would you, uh, there's one more questions there uh, because of the time issue. Uh, it's kind of big question, but maybe you can just simply answer that a bit. Yeah. Uh, I, the question is, I don't see the difference between the HALA logistic and normal logistic. And that you, can you help to show some of the important difference? So this important difference here is the non-HALA products. It can be any kind of products where the difference is with the HALA logistics, as now explained, uh, a normal logistic that it has to be separated uh, and uh, segregated and manage it uh, in the correct manner to comply with shared law of each country uh, that to stay in the HALA logistic and the normal logistic will still operate as usual, but it's not supposed to be segregated in the different truck, in a big warehouse, but it has to be seg segregated in the wall uh, operating separately in the section. Yeah, that is the requirements. I see. Uh, if this attendee uh, you want looking for a further discussion, please contact us or contact Mr. Andy Ooi for more discussion on the difference between Hala Logistics and the normal one. And today is very, uh, very thank you for Andy Ooi for the great presentation and a lot of uh, live Q&A answering. But uh, we would like to listen to you f uh, more from the uh, e-commerce topic under e-commerce topic later uh, during our panel discussion. So, Andy Oi, please stay right here. And I would like to welcome all the speakers to join us together again. So, okay. now all the speakers, if you can, you can find out there's a button on your screen. Please turn on your microphone and camera. Join me and Mr. Andy Oi. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Iris. Hi. Hello. Hello, I come back. <laughs> you come back, but your camera is black now. Really? Yeah, it is black. Yeah, I'll give you some more time. And also, uh, we're looking for or to see another speaker is Martin. Because Martin, I maybe have some connecting time. Uh, let's wait for him for a while while we answering the 
first questions, or shall we? Uh, dear attendees, you can find out all the questions on the agenda in the sessions page and the lobby page or the landing page of, of our webinar today. But anyway, I'll pass the questions here as well, publish them and let them to answer first. Since we have Andy and Renny right now, let's start yes. answering the questions so far you might uh, have the common interest together. Um, so, uh, Miss Miss Iris, yes. Iris, hi. <laughs> I want to. Uh, I would like to ask you kindly answer these questions under yes. the topic robot first, since okay. elite robot, right? Okay. All right. We are prepared. <laughs> well prepared. I'm ready. Let me publish the question for you. This question is under the topic robot. How can robotics in logistics help improve supply chain efficiency? Okay. Um, I'd like to answer this question from the angle of job uh, distribution, because usually the people, uh, they believe that um, the robot, it can one-to-one -one replace for the humans. So that's the traditional um, idea. And certainly in some uh, scenarios, it, it works such like I just mentioned the for a lot of pick and place work and some um, assembly work and also material handling. Uh, Carbots can do the re repetitive and uh, dangerous work on behalf of human beings. But we recognize that for the uh, for more advanced uh, requests of automation, sometimes we have to redefine the workflow. Like uh, we are not able to make each warehouse, each factory humanless. Although it's the a dream for a lot of companies, but we still see that uh, in the factory, in the warehouse, you can see the human beings because they are smarter and that they can use their wisdom to analysis, to judge some something. But if you want cobalt to do it, you have to uh, spend a lot of time to coach the cobalt. So we always say that the end users, even you give them the solution, finally, they have to accept the economic one. So it's like step, step by step. And in, in the process of making the progressive automation, we need to redefine the workflow and to keep the cobalt do some repetitive work and still leave some human beings. They can monitor the status of cobalt they can also use their wisdom to manage the situation in the warehouse. So that's our suggestion. Like we are not able to jump from zero, industrial one, industrial two, directly to industrial four. It's unreasonable. So when we talk about the um, possibility of robot, um, let me give some example. We are able to use 3D camera integrated with the robot to do some pick and place work. And uh, recently we also work with Solomon um, since they recognize that the bottleneck of cobalt is the speed. So we are able to work with them with dual arms to pick and place. But they use their intelligence algorithm to make the cobalt not fight with each other or hit with each other. And that they do some faster speed uh, pick and place. Um, certainly we, have, we can also consider about the scanner and also work with the RFID tag or uh, the, the other solutions. So that's my opinion. Uh, we still need to judge the real situation. Yeah. Okay, okay. great. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, if Mr. Zhong Guo from DHL, if you have any uh, different opinions from this topic, how can robotic in logistics help improve supply chain efficiency? Oh, by the way, uh, before you start answering this question, I would like to remind all the speakers, since this is a panel discussion, let's try to finish uh, one session of answering within two minutes so we can have more discussion. Is that all right? Okay, okay Mr. Jungwoo, let's go back to your session. About this topic, what do you think? Um, yeah, sure. I think it's really about improving supply chain efficiency. Uh, I think, you know, I think it's really about the use case, specific use case as well, um, you know, where it's really applicable and where there's a business case where we could um, really, you know, kind of elevate, you know, what the humans are already currently doing to, you know, value add in other areas. So more repetitive tasks that, you know, in day in, day out, where they have been doing it, can we upskill them instead of them, you know, managing um, uh, uh, doing the actual work, can they manage it, manage a feed of cobots, right? Or, or even a feed 
of robots instead of doing the work. So basically upskilling. And, and you know, in, in fact, I, I was just uh, mentioning about how, you know, average workers in logistics are currently like um, pretty old 55. You know, how can we attract younger talents, right? You know, through innovation uh, into the industry as well. Uh, and then again, you know, refreshing the whole workforce. And, you know, I mean, in terms from a very wider perspective, might, you know, um, increase the whole efficiency and productivity of a uh, supply chain. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, we finished the topic of the robot, but I would like to uh, ask, ask everyone to pay attention on the e-commerce problem. Now let's go to the Q&A mode, and I'd like to publish this one under the column e-commerce, what will shape the future landscape of e-commerce logistic? I would like to uh, ask Martin to answer this question first. Martin, is that all right? Martin, you have to turn on your microphone first. <laughs> You're mute. That's, that's always the initial issue. The mute exactly. Right. Thank you very much for having me on the panel. I'm uh, looking forward to a, to a uh, fruitful discussion here. Uh, the topic of e-commerce, what shapes the future? I mean, if we go back traditionally, e-commerce started a uh, long time back. It was very antiquated. The future will, first of all, we will see a huge increase um, of uh, e-commerce requirements over the next five, six, 10, 20 years. And we talk about exponential increase. Uh, at the moment, 14% is purchased online, which doesn't sound much, but if you, if you globalize that, it's an absolute high number. We are looking at potentially in the next two years to go to 25, 26, 30%. And it's a combination of uh, established environments purchasing more because it's possible, but then as well, the reduction of logistic barriers in developing countries. At the moment, uh, everything is very much focused on metro areas where you have quite good transportation environments. But um, as, as the requirements starts going outside of the metropolitan areas, um, the logistic infrastructure is getting better. So we will see a growth. What will shape it? Uh, ultimately, um, the technology utilization of existing technology and the on-demand requirement is becoming a norm. At the moment, um, companies do deliveries based on time-specific service, which is provided based on time-specific environments. Now, what is, what is demand, the on-demand delivery? On-demand delivery is ad hoc or a customer says, I want to have it in two days or in three days or one in six hours. So there is no real norm. And that on-demand requirement is currently already a key differentiator. And we will see that in the future, that when you want to buy something, you don't go into the slot when they supply it to you. You make that demand at any time you want. That is one. The other becomes more and more uh, interesting with regards to remote areas and that is drone deliveries and autonomous cars and electric vehicles uh, from a drone perspective at the moment you have a lot of small drones the drones which you have at home to do some last mile deliveries in front of your door which is at the moment more a gimmick than a, a commercial viable solution but um, we are for example uh, in discussion with a drone company, they have a payload up to 700 kilos on the drone. That's the size of a helicopter, but it's uh, autonomous, so it is remote. And what happens then is you can actually uh, go into remote areas at a very low cost. One should not forget that e-commerce is uh, the value of a purchase on e-commerce is very low. The average is somewhere between 20 and 30, 40 US dollars. So if you have that, you can't charge high del uh, delivery and logistic costs. So you have to somehow identify how you can lower that. And that is where the technology comes in. The drones come in. And of course, a reduction of manual approaches and processes. That is where we're going to see where we're going to see the, the landscape going forward. I see. So let's hear from the different aspects from Andy Ooi. Andy. Would you please yeah, unmute that and answer this question from your side? Okay, thank you. Uh, it is now the new norm. The business world digitalization is the only platform that will bring businesses 
globally. Huh? Like it or not, this is fact of life that every business has to evolve into digitalization, into the e-commerce, such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, etc., to be more successful. Therefore, the logistic transportation industry makes no different from that other businesses. The V2 must be able to part with the system in order to provide a better service more efficiently to the customer. Thank you. And I believe that if we have the robot, like for example from Ely Robot, it will help to develop this market trend better. Certainly, yes. Because Let's of hear the from robot. the different opinion from Mr. Longguo, and thank you for answering and the OI. Thank you. From THL, Longguo, what about these questions? Um, I think I, I, I actually I'd like to add on to what Martin is here. I, I think I agree that um, we, we should explore this technology to really automate the process and, and explore different ways of um, delivery. Um, in, in fact, in DHL, we have also explore uh, drone deliveries and, and into what um, Martin has mentioned about cargo drones, right? Um, delivering uh, parts into remote areas. Uh, we have, uh, you know, kind of trial the use case and still building that uh, um, the expertise and, and, and that business case in there. Uh, but I do agree that there needs to be a, di a diversified form of technology and delivery options and on-demand options. And, and today, you know, um, we're seeing government organizations scaling up 5G infrastructure, which will potentially help uh, build that infrastructure as well, right? The 5G connectivity, real-time visibility, so uh, you probably be able to, to really see exactly where, at which point of time your, your parcel is, yeah. yeah. Perhaps, perhaps uh, I would like to jump on that um, um, to expand on it. What I mentioned with regards to where the future is, that is where you have autonomous vehicles, drones, etc. But what's happening today already, and it will be scaled globally and across uh, um, many, many uh, 3PLs, and that is uh, the digitization. At the moment, an average post office uh, in Southeast Asia has only about 50% of the data digitized which means uh, anything which needs to be delivered, a lot of it is still written on an envelope. So that's change from, uh, from um, into digitized uh, matter is very critical. Once you have it digitized, and today uh, 3PLs in the private sector is very much advanced already. Our technology, for example, ensures that we digitize any everything and more importantly, uh, attribute the location or the address with the accurate geocodes. And that is one of the biggest challenges, especially in e-commerce logistics, because the individual user is not a B2B, it's a B2C. So the address always changes. And if you look at theoretically 7 billion people, you have a huge amount of addresses and requirements for delivery and pickup to identify the right location for the pickup and delivery to reduce cost and not to have a re-delivery. And DHL can appreciate that, that if you don't do a delivery the first time, the second and third attempt is equally expensive. So to come up and be able to use the latest uh, technology and data analytics to, to do the capacity allocation onto the vehicles and the assets on the ground and then optimize the routing to reduce costs and to increase customer satisfaction. And that is currently what's, what is starting to happen and uh, it's propagated. And therefore, if you today purchase anything online, you will see that the delivery costs will not vary very much. Yeah? They are getting down and move forward. Before we start, I uh, have the opinion from the other speaker. Now I would like to uh, uh, invite Andy. Uh, yeah, please try to mute your the other device. So we are having some echoes here. And I would like to invite all the speakers. If you are not answering the questions, yes, you might just mute your microphone for now uh, to have a better connection to all of them. Thank you, Rennie. And OK, uh, since we have talked about more about e-commerce, I would like to bring this topic to the table. E-commerce, how does transport and logistics fit in the e-commerce equation? It's an interesting topic. 
basically, we think uh, we answer this uh, this topics first, and then maybe when we have more time, we will go to the chat box in the attendee platform. Now they're having more questions to the panel discussion. Now for this question, I would like to ask. Okay, since you have all answer ready, who can who's one who who uh, who want to answer this question first? Raise your hand. Great, Martin, you have the first shot. Please <laughs> answer this question from uh, you. I think uh, let, let us first uh, look at the question, how does transport logistics fit into e-commerce? Now, e-commerce is any, everything bought online. So logistics is a key component for the success of the purchase. Initially, when e-commerce started to get big, the, the uh, um, excitement was look at all the products online. Nowadays, you can find any products on any website, the same products as well. What differentiates that is actually the logistics behind it. And the control and the, uh, the control of the consumer comes at the point when the item has been purchased. Once the item has been purchased, the customer wants to make the decision how quickly the item comes to you or in what form, what shape, at what time, etc. Um, the judgment of a good service is not the product because the product can be bought anywhere. It is how the product is being delivered to you. And we've all been in that situation where you, you order various products from various websites. The first thing you do afterwards is, where's my product now? Has it been checked out? And who's gonna do the delivery? Can I check, where do I get visibility? So that is where logistics becomes very critical. And because of e-commerce, uh, the customer wants to be empowered and we are looking at visibility. The ideal situation is to have real-time visibility in last mile, which is rather simple. But when we look at the entire supply chain, when it comes from a different country, you have about 200, 200 activities for a delivery of a package. And you potentially have three or four service providers touching that package. How do you make sure you have the visibility and know at any time where the item is? That is where the challenge comes into, and uh, there are solutions for it, which, which we as a company provide. But um, the importance is that the customer has visibility and the customer can make decisions on the spot. And the demand requirement, even if the item has already been dispatched, the customer wants to make the decision, sorry, don't bring it to my house, I'm gonna be at Starbucks, deliver it there. That is where logistics, the latest logistics and the, the aspiration of the industry goes to. Yeah. As a last point, perhaps um, logistics itself, because when we talk about e-commerce, we very much focus on the metropolitan areas. And um, you have the, uh, the assets, you have a lot of good service providers who are already quite visible. Uh, but to expand that, to the rural areas is probably the next frontier, but the same uh, uh, process applies and the technology applies as well. Logistic infrastructure and the investment gaps, especially outside of urban centers need to be addressed, very important. And that means 3G, 4G, whatever you have. The same as access to quality services. Uh, a vehicle which has uh, four tires is not good enough anymore in order to satisfy your service requirements. And the next, which we don't address too often is the cross border, which is customs and regulatory bodies. You can optimize upstream and downstream, but if you don't optimize the middle mile and the uh, customs clearance, which normally takes potentially three, four, five days, all the good work and the focus in order to get customer satisfaction in first and last mile, is down the tubes because um, the regulatory bodies have not embraced the technology yet. So therefore, uh, when looking at an end-to-end -end network optimization visibility, one needs to look at the first mile, which is origin to a port or seaport, uh, airport or seaport, middle mile, which is air freight or sea freight, and then last mile delivery. And that can be visualized through according data in real time and then optimized in the first and last mile to reduce costs and improve efficiencies. Great point. Um, I would like to answer, invite Mr. Andy Ooi. Do you have any different opinion on this? Yes. <clears throat> what Martin was saying was quite correct. Ultimately, the logistic 
provider has to be also ready to complement the delivery service of the goods that the consignee or the recipient need to monitor uh, where is my goods. They have to do the tracing if their goods is missing for another few days. And that they can also, uh, the freight logistics have to also sell freight charges through the platform of uh, e-commerce by buying and selling freight charges for delivery. And so, so provide the efficient communication without human uh, in, involved directly, uh, with, which is something that is very important. Uh, more accuracy through the uh, platform of e-commerce where a lot of information that basic required is all answered. I think this is something that uh, everyone is now planning towards this, uh, all the logistic industry worldwide, everyone is actually uh, buying to this idea to be to progress into the future of the logistic industry. Thank you. I think I think you raised a very valid point, and your which is the communication part. Um, in the past, they are big and, and still are service centers. Lots of people they answer calls. What do they do? They get a question from a customer. The first question is, "Where's my package?" So they have to then somehow trace and speak to the service provider where the package is. So what happens is you give a 24 hour notice period and say, you're going to call back in 24 hours. Now that is fine if you've got three or four callers, but if you have hundreds and thousands who want to have that information, what do you do? Now with technology, because of the visibility, the individual customer can have on his mobile phone, you don't need to call anyone anymore. So the, the contact centers will reduce. And if you still have a contact center, you just need a couple of people because they will have the technology and the visibility of every single package, right? So that reduces cost, reduces frustration of the customer and increases efficiencies. And uh, guess what? You buy more often. Correct. I see. Uh, then great reply on Martin. So what about Mr. Trungo? Do you have different opinion on this? uh not really uh but i think coming from an innovation standpoint right i think we we, we also see it as a trend uh today logistics company don't just uh, you know the operational part of it the whole infrastructure we can meet demands by buying more planes you know building more facilities to 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 meet the demands yeah uh but from an innovation perspective can we then digitalize uh the whole 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 process and you know, look at customer experience, right? Uh, this, this, we also now need to look at the whole customer experience, introduce technology, uh, like what uh, Martin has mentioned about IoT. You know, how can we uh, use IoT to, to, to create visibility or even for cross border and customs? You know, people talk about, you know, can we have a, a blockchain? Uh, we, we talk about blockchain the technology like blockchain uh, that could help with customs issues. Of course, again, um, blockchain is still a very, um, I would say very, very, uh, not very mature to an extent where, you know, uh, it will involve so many other parties to come together, uh, but the need to, you know, introduce technology to digitalize uh, the operations, uh, I think is key. Yeah, and, and, and on that point, uh, you mentioned something which I think we tend to not address. If you look at the global logistic infrastructure, it's a $1.7 trillion business, and this number is already two years old. Uh, the assets, which are the vehicles, which are the ships, which are the aircrafts and warehouses and anything which belongs to logistics is being underutilized. You have peak times and especially now during COVID, they are maximized. But in general, you have still assets which are underutilized. And the idea of, let's say I'm a 3PL buying more trucks is counterintuitive because technology now allows you to actually bring demand and supply together. And what technology does is, and, and here is the optimization aspect. You want to maximize the capacity of your assets. That means a vehicle you have, you want to make sure it's 90% full and not 30% full. However, still today, many, many, I would say 90% of the delivery companies go by area delivery. They have 20 areas and they attribute one or two vehicles to that area. If that area has only two packages, guess what? The vehicle will do the delivery and is 90% empty. So all of that needs to be relooked at and technology can do that because you know exactly the amount of deliveries you have to do. If you have 100 trucks, you fill these trucks 
and then you optimize the routing based on what is in the back. And therefore, you can reduce up to 30%, even 40%, the utilizations of your assets, which means if you needed before 100 vehicles to do the delivery, you just need about 70 or 65 vehicles, right? And that is where efficiency comes in, reduces cost, but at the same time reduces carbon footprint as well. Okay, great point. So, um, Aris, since uh, you are the expert of robot, would you like to share some points of IoT? Can we uh, apply in the e-commerce? Um, I'd like to share you the story in China because um, e-commerce is quite, quite popular. It influenced our life, daily life, the work. You can purchase everything. We even make joking. You can you can order a girlfriend or boyfriend. <laughs> really? I need that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But I'd like to mention that um, within these years, each year, uh, a lot of um, the manufacturers and the, uh, the sellers they they will they will promote in order to sell more so currently each year we have two uh very gorgeous shop we call a uh, shopping carnival one is in june one is in november especially for the one in november we call it double 11 that means on the 11th november and we made a lot of we broke a lot of uh, records in such carnival i'll give you the data uh like uh yes before in 2018 and there's an incredible number that within two minutes, the total revenue reach 10 billion RMB just within two minutes after zero o'clock. That means everybody they are shopping. So uh, I'd like to mention that um, currently for the logistics and for e-commerce, we should also consider that they have the peak season. Uh, do you understand what I mean? Yeah, they have the peak season. So although we can have well planned in the uh, average months, but we need to consider that in the peak season, how can we meet the expectation of the uh, buyers? The consumers, they will not tolerate a late delivery, even in uh, the shopping carnival. They always think that within one or two days, I can get my package. So I fully agree with Martin that we need to make the whole process visible and trackable. And also some uh, system, they begin to set up their own logistic agency because if they hire a third party, they, that means they rely on the service of the third party. But simultaneously, we need to consider uh, such for infrastructures, equipment, just what I mentioned, the devices and the robots, are they flexible enough to meet such abnormal situation? Yes. So I think it will be a very uh, interesting topic. Uh, as I know, such like Alibaba, Jingdong, uh, the top two emerging uh, e-commerce uh, e giants, they have their own warehouse. And they also uh, invest a lot of money to purchase and upgrade their, their, their equipment mm. to make more, much smarter. So that's my sharing. Okay. I think, I think a very valid point, and of course you have to pitch the biggest nightmare is the 11-11, absolutely. Uh, in the rest of the world is Christmas, etc. But uh, you're right, but, but already I think we are at that point already, because, and I'm coming back to utilize the delivery assets in the market. Mm -hmm. And even during 11.11, you will see trucks which are not fully loaded. Why? Because there is no visibility and there is no communication. And if you want to simplify it in terms of how to address it, you would look at an uberized logistic model, which means it doesn't really matter who owns the asset, as long as there is an ability to identify what capacity is available. And if there is a pickup at a certain address, and you're connected technically through a platform, any vehicle and that the algorithm will determine who is the closest to that port, uh, to, to that pickup point, depending on the criteria, you will then have anyone who has a car or a boot, right, where you can put a couple of packages in, can actually participate for two or three days. They don't have to be three PLs, but they have the assets to put packages in. And that will reduce that huge peak the worst thing what you can do is to gear up for 11 and 11 and purchase another thousand vehicles or rent thousand vehicles because the uh, the, uh, the infrastructure is actually available but not enough technology or, or platforms are being utilized or integrated in to make it visible 
All right. Um, since we've been talking about this e-commerce for a long time, I would like to invite uh, if anyone to have the last uh, conclusion, maybe before we jump to the next topic, which is the food and beverage industry. Do you have any? Raise your hand, please. All right. The question is still, how does transport and logistics fit in e-commerce? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, we are going to, before we jump to the next topic. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, all right. All right, let's see the next topic. I would like to talk about the food and beverage industry. And even we don't, uh, we lost the contact uh, connection with Zongguo, but we will come back to him later. So for this topic, maybe Martin, you would like to share some opinion first? Uh, for this topic, um, I mean, ultimately, if you look at the supply chain, um, and this is um, food and beverage, uh, the challenge is returns as well. So um, if you look at the supply chain, it's not only the transportation. In the middle, you have the, the four walls, manufacturing or value add. So what you have ultimately is you have the supply, which is, let's say, raw material. Um, and if you take one raw, uh, raw material as one data point, let's say there are a million data points coming into you, where into your manufacturing four walls. Then there's value add and then the items leave as a product. So 1 million items become maybe 20,000 items and they need to be distributed. So the, uh, the technology and the, the focus of efficiency applies almost the same way. Upstream, which is going into the warehouse, needs to be optimized. And that could be the same way as we optimize any delivery. And then the last mile. What becomes the biggest challenge and I think there are more and more companies and tech companies focusing on the manufacturing optimization, uh, uh, forecast planning, which normally is done six months in advance, depending on the industry, right? But nowadays, because you have visibility and you cut the process into very small windows, every time you have a demand, you can do a quick, uh, you, you have a better visibility and you can make shorter forecast demands. And with that, potentially avoid big peaks and troughs, uh, troughs uh, uh, which might not be beneficial. Yeah. The other aspect is um, for food and food and beverage is of course, um, if it is instant food delivery, which a lot of people use nowadays, it needs to be time definite very quickly. You can't deliver foods, consumption, takes an hour, two hours, has to be immediately. So you need to build uh, individual logistic centers in certain areas in order to supply and support your customers there. I see, that's a very wide topic. So um, since the topic talk about the normal logistic for food and beverage, I guess, uh, Andy, Aoi, can you give us a short opinion from the halal logistic on this site? Yes. Uh Basically, food and beverage industry, they also require a very strong logistic provider. Uh, of course, the last mile delivery is what their concern, as what Martin mentioned. Uh, each country now became very popular for grab delivery, for instance. Uh, not the courier service that will take two days or one day or, or, or more than that. So where the food and beverage, certain products that for consumable is uh, immediate that you need to deliver fresh and it got to be on the spot. So therefore, the, uh, the, the industry uh, platform for the delivery, it goes under different uh, category. Uh, we have the logistic transportation for the air, for the sea, for the road, but now it's a smaller one that for consumable food and beverage, got to be on the grabs. So the bigger item that went we mentioned about the food and beverage delivery. You require co truck, co warehousing uh, for the temporary storage in case the ship or the plane is delayed. So we have to have that kind of perishable co room facility in order to cater to this particular area of industry. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that. And um, before we finish this topic of, of the food and beverage, Renny, I believe that this topic is a, a bit uh, not related to the to your questions, right? Uh, to your uh, no, worries. Uh, no worries. I always oh, have 
stories. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's fine. But yeah, I believe you have one question in the chat box. I think that's related to you. I'll uh, publish this one. Okay. Thank you. Oh, uh, this one. Typically, typically, how much percentage of the cost can be saved by inco? cooperating robots in the supply chain. Is this related to your territory? I don't think the incorporating robots is only means the, the car bots. Ah, but, I uh, see. Can, yeah, I can answer this question from the angle of car bots, okay? Maybe, and, yeah, sure, sure yeah, a little yeah. bit of opinion too. Yeah, today in the in the presentation, I mentioned about the ROI because uh, most of the customer they uh, they they take it very serious. They want to know that how long time can they take off their investment. So we give the number like eight to twelve months. Yeah, so that's the average uh, standard. Yeah, since the total solution is combined not only with the cobalt arms but also end effectors, sometimes sensors. So also you need some hardware like uh, a table or like some how can i say some devices um, but while we think uh, it's a very uh, good calculation uh, stuff because usually people just calculate the direct cost they will look at the salary of a worker so they just make a simple calculate calculation if one cover can replace for one human beings within one year how much does it cost for his salary but um, actually, I will always remind them that think about indirect costs, such like the maintenance fee each year, because cobalt is maintain, maintain less. And also, you don't need to purchase additional safety fence, or if you have some, uh, some how can I say, unstable order uh, due to the peak season, then you can very flexible to deploy your cobalt. Today, you can use it to do pick and place, and tomorrow to do the school driving. And uh, uh, just to connect the last question about food and the beverage, actually for Elite Robot, we made direct business and indirect business from these scenarios. Taking direct, uh, in direct business, for example, it's very suitable to do the palletizing work. That means to catch the box on the baby oh. bed and then put in the box. Huh? So that's the normal thing for the yeah. robot to do. And while I mentioned indirect business, so the story comes from the COVID-19. As we see that all the restaurants, it's, it's closed, or even it's open, uh, they, they don't accept the, uh, the consumers to eat in the restaurant. So the takeaway food business become booming. And a lot of people, they lose their job in the factory. Then they go to do the takeaway food uh, service. They drive delivery, their motor. Yeah. yeah, delivery. And at that, at that time, there's huge demand of their helmets because they need to drive the motorcycle, bicycle. So the capacity of the helmet company, uh, helmet manufacturer couldn't meet the needs. So they decided to add some cobalt to help them. So when they calculate the, the labor cost, maybe they think it's not that reasonable, but at that time, um, the salary of each worker is very high at that time because nobody wants to work in the factory. It's a little bit dangerous and mm -hmm. the, the people, they stay at home and, and they, they don't work in the factory. So who can support the cobots? They do some polishing, polishing uh, job for the helmet. So we take this um, business and also make money from it. So I'd like to give you the, this story because usually when the people are talking about cost of percentage and the, the, the payment terms, oh, sorry, not payment, the, the ROI. I don't believe it's the root cause of them not using cobalt. The cost is always not the, the root cause. The root cause is they didn't find the valuable thing, more valuable that uh, can persuade them to use it. So that's our task to um, inspire the customers. And not only for the industrial uh, applications, traditional ones like beverage, food, and the others. Sometimes when the booming business comes, you can also find the opportunities. So that's my that's my answer. Yeah, thank you. Great. Uh, from Andy or Martin, would you like to reply on that too? Yeah, I quickly jump into that. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, what you say, Renny, it's it's uh, it, it all comes together. It's a fixed cost and variable cost as a combination. 
And uh, we have seen, uh, we are a tech logistic company and uh, we are, uh, our customers are 3PL, traditional logistics, last mile, multi-mile, uh, anything which is to do with transportation. And what we have seen, SMEs or enterprise companies, the average cost reduction and savings, it's a combination of having the correct addresses, so you don't have to do two or three uh, delivery runs, right? And or maximum utilization of your assets, as efficient as possible through technology. You are looking at uh, average uh, between 25 to 30, 35% cost reduction. And that is, uh, the first layer is always to have the right processes. And a lot of 3PL companies and big companies like DHL, UPS have very solid um, processes. But these processes are now need to be supported with technology. And I think in, in the video which was shown by DHL uh, at the very beginning of today's session, you could see that robot who was just um, allocating the packages into the certain slots. Now, I used to be with DHL Express, so I know very much the process, <laughs> right? So that in itself is a huge cost reduction. But it is not only the cost reduction of not having to pay six, seven people, but it is the efficiency and the accuracy. I would say in general, and the numbers are just vague remembrance, normally you have up to 10% mistakes where you put the package in. So that itself, the costs of then re-looking at that or potentially do the delivery to the wrong address is a cost. And if you multiply that over millions and millions of packages, that's an absolute number. So that is where the saving comes in and the efficiency drives the cost down. Great. Okay, so it comes to to the end of the, our uh, customized, I mean, the virtual conference today. And we've actually learned a lot from our all our speakers today, especially during this panel discussion time. From Mr. Andy Oi, we learned some, uh, the, uh, the logistic from Halal uh, knowledge. And from Ren Yi, Iris, we learned a lot from the cobot and robot things. And Martin, a lot of aspect from you. <laughs> Thank you for your sharing today. And I'd like to uh, make a conclusion to all of you and try to uh, finish this panel right now. Uh, before that, do you have anything to add before I finish the panel discussion and jump to con uh, closure? Uh, yeah, perhaps. Uh, first of all, I'm reachable. Quinkus and uh, our website and uh, my email address, martin.dudek at quinkus.com. I'm very open. I think it is very important to articulate and bring the tradition or the logistics and, and bring that together with technology. It's not something which, all right, let's do it and it's a great day to have. It needs a lot of discussion as well. And um, how do we bring that together? So I'm very open for anyone to contact me to give a bit more insight on how uh, logistics and technology together is actually a winning solution. Great. I, I believe that Iris have something to say. Yes, I have already got some email from the audience. So that <laughs> surprised me. And uh, um, just now we have already replied to some of them. And I do sincerely thank for the uh, support by Rinia and also very glad to hear different opinions and comments from, um, from, the, from the other uh, speakers. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Of course. Thank you for your time joining. And also, Andy, thank you for your time today for to be with us and talk about, uh, teach us a lot of knowledge here. Thank you, Andy. Okay. I'd like to thank all the speakers. Uh, I'm about to uh, come to the end of our virtual conference. Looking forward to see all of you to join our future event. Thank you again. Bye-bye. 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 Okay, bye-bye. Okay. I'll go back to my agenda. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Let me go to the uh, the conclusion of our uh, virtual conference today. Before we finish, please remember, you have downloaded our digital folder already. You can find it in the lobby if you scroll down or find it in the conference room if you sc scroll down. There's a big banner called click this one and download our digital folder. You can find all the contact information of our speakers today. 
I believe that just like what Iris Miss Miss Iris Miss Ren Yi just said, we believe that the further discussion we can make during after during the event or after the event. Also, now our virtual conference has come to its end. Thank you to all our participants who joined us in this special virtual conference with the online lobby and the exhibition hall as well. In addition, we thank to our guest speakers for giving us insightful speech regarding new technologies and applications that can boost your productivity and create products to meet today's demand. If you have further questions, you are welcome to check your website as well. And also, they said you can email them. Once again, thank everyone for grace, gracing our virtual conference with your presence. We truly appreciate, appreciate it. And me as Jack, uh, uh, on behalf of Ringer, looking forward to see all of you to join our virtual conference, have a great connection, great networking next time in our future event. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Ago, Two years ago, started Elite started to plan a new generation of robots. robots. The launch of the, the, launch CS, of the series CS series helped bring our helped latest bring understanding, our latest of, understanding robots of robots into reality. Into reality. This, is the, this is the type of product that, that exemplifies the state of the art level of the, the, the industry. Elite CS Elite series CS robots series are equipped for multiple patented, multiple patented technologies, technologies to enhance safety, to enhance safety which, which is compliant with international standards, standards such as the ISO 10218, ISO 13849, and ISO slash TS 15066. The wrist joints module design 